On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try a bottle of Balblair 12 year that I smuggled back from Scotland. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not drinking contraband. Not yet. Mm. The history of the Gallic lands is one of struggle punctuated by moments of sheer brilliance. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world, and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to USA Kilts. I am Rocky. That's Eric. Yo. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, hope you like our new intro. We had a little bit of time playing around with that. Yeah. Um, today, special treat. But don't tell anybody. Shh. We try some contraband. Um, I brought back some Balblair from Scotland. Uh, just over there. So brought it back to share with my friends here and then judge it harshly. So we're show. accessories to a felony. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Smuggled through the proper channels <laughs> customs. So it's not really smuggled. Just, you know, shoved in the suitcase. Is it so. Balbear? Balblair or Ball Blair? Exactly. Mm, okay. It is. It's one of those. So blah, blah, blah. Emma, why don't you come collect your Yes, our MC today is yes. Emma. As you will find out momentarily. Who is this Emma person glass, we're talking about? And tell us about your your beautiful non-tartan today. I've got my saffron kilt on. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, oh, whoop. wait, I like the pin. Whoop, whoop. Oh, What's yeah. the pin? Wrong side. There, there you go. There Ooh, go. little terror That's brooch. cool. Yeah, there you go. That's nice. Very nice. Super cool. Totes adorbs. Aaron Gabra. All right. You're a little early, but... It's, it's quite all right. Um, Eric, what do you have on today? McPherson. McPherson. Modern. McPherson. There Ma is no fear McPherson. in McPherson. Yes, my I. You know, I have messed that up ever since I started working here. And I don't know why. Fair. Fair. I was scared by a McPherson when yes. I was a child, probably. Yes. So yes, McPherson Martin. And Rocky, what are you wearing today? As if today, I didn't know. I. What am I wearing? <laughs> I won't call you out. This is the McDonald Clam Ranald. Uh, Which they can't weathered. see because of the table. Yeah, they can see a little bit right there inside. The okay. okay. Um, made lovingly for me. By my friend Barb Tewksbury. Yep. Oh, I paid yeah. for it. Don't worry. Doctor um, Barb's Tewksbury. Right? Yes. 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 Doctor. The doctor. Yeah. Me and Big B are on like. <laughs> are on I, like I'll call you once in a while basis. <laughs> I love Barb. I've talked cool. to her a lot more. I watched she's, the. She's uh, a lovely person. The the thing for the VNA Dundee Museum there uh, or the VNA Dundee. Uh, their presentation that they put out online. She and I watched it and were texting back and forth during the whole thing at like five in the morning because mm -hmm. it was 10 a.m. over there. Um, anyway. That's very, on... that's very Zoomer of you. Yes. Thank yeah, the, you. Kid, the kids thank do you. that. They watch shows and just talk on Discord the whole time. So. Yes. <laughs> me, me and the, uh, uh, the I, won't, I, won't really, or I won't tell everyone Barb's age, but me, me and Barb Tewksbury are very Zoomer. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So. Bell Blair gets to get back on topic. Emma, what do we got there for some tasting notes mm. for Bell Blair? All right. So on the nose, we've got elegant, bright lemon peel layered with creamy vanilla and crisp green apples. Now, now you see why I bought this because I saw all that. And I was like, damn, I like all of those things. Uh, pretty damn good. I mean, yeah. for once, for once, my faulty brain sensory apparatus agrees with the notes. Okay. I mean, that's. In other words, fruity and a little acidic. Yeah. But it a little bit floral. It's a, it's a very nice nose. Yeah, it's I lovely. agree. Lovely. Slancha. Hmm. A little pepperier, mm -hmm. a, little, a little warmer, mm -hmm. so to speak, than a usual Highland for me. Yeah, so but, the tasting notes we're supposed to be getting is ground spices and dried orange slices enveloped intense, <coughs> in intense set honey sweetness. It is very sweet. Well, it's not super sweet, but it is sweet. Yeah, I definitely, I get a lot of pepper. It's it's a reasonable amount of sweetness. I get, yes. the, I get the orange zest, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of pepper for me. Yeah, it is peppery. I want to try cutting it a touch. With a tiny bit of water. Hmm. 
The finish is creamy and leathery with notes of sweet vanilla. I was going to say, it's very leathery. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I finally found one. You got it. <laughs> I yeah. finally yeah. found ding, ding, one. Ding, we have a <laughs> so happy. Mm. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> he likes it. He really likes it. So, all right. Emma, how are you feeling about it so oh, far? Shit. Have you smelled or uh, snorted or sipped? <laughs> I've done all both. Uh, all three, all, all both. three, all both. Yeah. yeah, good for you. Um, yeah, I like this one quite a bit. Uh, this is probably my favorite one that we've tried so far. Out of the three? Out of the three, yeah. How many? I've got a pretty developed palate at this point. I've tried mm. three mm -hmm. whiskeys. You're an Sommelier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting notes of uh, dried robin's blood. The water definitely chilled out the pepper. Definitely chilled it down a little bit. You can put too much water in. I liked it better before I watered it down. How weird is that? Because I think I lost some of the sweetness. Interesting. Yeah, maybe I lost a little bit of sweetness. I'm getting more leather, like as I'm drinking it now. Yeah. Than necessarily aftertaste, but still getting it. For the now. uh for the tobacco guys out there, I think this would be a good whiskey with a pipe. Yeah. This is this is definitely a good tobacco pairing. I'd yeah. agree with that 100 percent Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. This is very nice. Yeah, it is. Feel the, free uh, to steal some more. Yeah. The uh, throughout the show, I will. Um, <laughs> the uh, I'm trying to remember what the price was. It was it was one there was like I was at the the duty free shop or whatever in the airport, um, and it was on sale. It was like a good chunk off. So I was looking at this one and a couple other ones I had never had or heard of before. Um, so I want to say it was forty five pounds, but it was on sale already. So let's say it was sixty. Let's say eighty or ninety dollars normal price on sale for about sixty or so. Um, okay, so that's I, fair. I think it's 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 yeah. a it's that's I think good... it would be a, a good. I think ninety would be a bit high. I wouldn't want to pay ninety bucks for it. Yeah, but sixty bucks it's a good value. I would agree. I agree with that. Yeah, mm. I agree with myself for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> um, like you always. Indeed. All right, so Emma, how are you feeling about? The Bell Blair 12. I like it a lot. I think I'm going to go with maybe a seven and a half. I don't drink it. 7.5? I think I, mm -hmm. I might get this for my uh, boyfriend for Valentine's Day. Aww. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Very That's good. Sweet. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if it's available in the States. Oh, man. Because I haven't seen it, but. That would. Yeah. Hmm. But we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen for yeah. you. We'll figure right. it out one way Thanks. or another. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. Don't Eric. ask too many questions. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I'm up there. I'd give this like an 8.1. I would actually buy this. Yeah. Nice. I definitely like this. Nice. Very good. Yep. Um, I'm debating between like a seven, nine, eight, one. Do what I what I drive out of my way to go get it. Yeah, I'll give it an eight one. Yeah. I, I would drive and get it. I would drive and get oh, it. We have a matching score. That's weird too. Yeah. Can I also point out that they get extra cool points for me because they have a. You probably can't see it here, guys, but. Yeah, I don't know if the camera's going to... Oh, wait. Yeah, you can see it. That, they've got like a... Thank you, Adam. They have a uh, a Pictish... Uh, a version of a Pictish Z-Rod as their logo. And on the cap. Which is so freaking cool. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. So It's, it's not exactly a Z-Rod, but it's pretty close. Yeah, it's on the cap as well. Yep. Established 1790. BC. So, exactly. They've been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. They were Picts, oddly enough. Um... Okay, cool. So, boys and girls, that's our rating for the Bal Blair. As always, please load in your questions. Um, we are about your humble servants here to answer any questions about kilts and or culture-related questions that you have to ask us while we are waiting for people to start tippity-tappity typing on their keyboards. Well, I have a feeling they probably already have been. First, a little bit of uh, uh, housekeeping. Okay. Uh, number one, it's Groundhog's Day. <gasps> So uh, we took it upon ourselves to see if there was a tartan for Groundhog's Day. And I have notes here, but Emma, do you want to do the honors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The okay. very exciting Groundhog tartan. And Cambot, can we put that up on Still, still Store? Yes. Good MST3K reference. Okay. Very nice. So if the sun comes out on a clear blue morning, the Groundhog will see his shadow. Again, the darker shadow person portion is asymmetric, as if light is shining on the lines from the left-hand side. 
The turquoise seemed to go with the bright yellow and reminded me of a warm Caribbean vacation, which I'm sure many people on the East Coast may be dreaming of right now. Um, that's I from now, the designer. I want to see... doesn't feel Pennsylvania enough to me. But I want to see what a shadow person looks like, and now I'm thinking that, like, the groundhog is actually scared by the shadow person that only it knows exists, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, that's why it hides mm -hmm. back in its hole. Yeah, okay. Oh. I'm, I apologize. It was shadow portion. I know. <laughs> shadow yeah. I know. Yeah, no, but that's horrifying. No, no, yeah. no, no. The flub is better. I love it. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Poor Puxatani Phil. Yes. Poor guy. There's actually a lot of groundhogs though. We have we have a local one in, in Reading, according to Patrick. There's... Not anymore. Or get my <laughs> got your vermin rifle. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. I don't. I think commemorative tartans can be fun, but I'm not that thrilled with that one. It's eh, meh. Doesn't yeah. feel groundhoggy to me. I like the I like the thought of making it asymmetrical to look like the shadow mm -hmm. and d doing that. I thought that was a clever clever twist on it. I like that idea. Yes, yes. But I just yes. Che cheers to whoever the designer like, was. Doesn't feel like uh, Pennsylvania to me enough. Yeah, fair. right. So second bit of housekeeping, which is also our first question, as I think some of you know, Rocky has just returned from Scotland. Scotland. From Alba, uh, yes. hence the whiskey. So people wanted to know what was going on with your trip. So Scott Sanders asked us, what was the coolest thing you saw on your trip to Scotland? And then we had some other follow-up questions. Do you want all the follow-up questions now? Sure. Okay. Uh, these are from Peter Hutchinson and Carla McLaughlin. Uh, how much iron brew did you drink? Two cans. What did you bring back? Well, whiskey and a rock. A rock. And rock. can you report on the health and wellness of Nessie? The <clears throat> we were on um, Loch Ness. We went up to uh, the little river boat tour cruise thing, um, and then went to Urquhart Castle. Um, the captain of the river boat uh, was giving all kinds of facts about things that went down in Loch Ness, and was talking about Nessie and da 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 da, da. You know, like when, all the, when the Nessie last Nessie sighting was, and things like that. Um, and there is apparently a reward for photographic evidence of Nessie. And my son Liam was overly excited about the reward aspect. So he was looking for Nessie, just like, well, I'm, if I get 20,000 pounds, I'm gonna be rich, this is great, I gotta find Nessie, I gotta take, so he's out there the whole time with a little like, camera looking for it. So, yes, indeed. You ever watch the Venture Brothers? Occasionally, I haven't seen it for a long time. Nessie is a plesiosaur. <laughs> Plesiosaur. Okay, anyway. Yes. Oh, that'll be a clip that goes in here. A f***ing plesiosaur. Yeah. Um, and Carla wanted to know if you got over to and saw the underground city uh, in, in Edinburgh? Edinburgh, which is, I think she's referring to Mary's, uh, Queen Mary's clothes. No. Which is uh, something I would love to see. Yeah. It's, I'd I really love to see that. I, I, is it Queen Mary's clothes? I forget. There, there's a bunch of clothes. That's just basically yeah, but Mary's the is the alleys, Mary's is the, the really intense one. Yeah. yeah so. Um. No, I didn't go to Edinburgh. Um. So no, I didn't see that. I was there several years ago. Um. Like mm. early, like 2010, 12, somewhere in there. Um. But no, I have not. I did not go back to Edinburgh. Um. At some point, I will. I'd, I'd love to go back to Edinburgh. It's a cool city. Mm -hmm. Um. But no, I went to Glasgow and then over to Stirling and then up to Inverness for a few days and came down to Appen and Fort William and kind of like played down the left side of Scotland mm -hmm. a little bit and then mm -hmm. back to mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Oban and then went to uh, Glasgow back to the airport and jumped on a, back, back a, a flying metal tube mm -hmm. hurled into the air. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. So that's so, so, but what was in a nutshell the coolest thing? <clears throat> Coolest thing. The coolest thing you saw or experienced. Okay. So I went over for a trade show. So the I'm of two minds. The 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 business geek in me um loves I wanted to go for the trade show. Like it's it, it's it that to me, like for those of you who don't like your job, <laughs> this is gonna sound painful, but I love my job. I love what I do. I love seeing the new stuff that's coming out for the industry. I love talking to the suppliers in the industry because I'm, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles away from home base. You know, all the mills, all of our suppliers are over in the UK and I'm way over here out on an island. Well, they're on the island. I'm on what? the mainland. But anyway, <laughs> the uh, I I love 
going to the trade show and kind of conversing with my peers and suppliers and things like that. I love, I got to meet Peter McDonald, you know, talk to him for a little bit and John McLeish from the uh, Scottish Tartans Authority. Mm -hmm. I got to talk to all the suppliers and kind of geek out on the new stuff that's coming out and what they're planning on doing still. And okay. that's, that is in a weird, weird way of people will find it weird, but I don't, that's fine. Um, finding new suppliers and seeing new products and innovation is the fun bit to me. Mm -hmm. I love doing mm -hmm. that. Um, and I love like engaging with people. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, the other weirdest, coolest moment um, was engaging with no one. <laughs> the, uh, on, <laughs> on, on the last full day of the trip, we were staying up in Inverness and we just basically drove down, you know, the, the edge of Loch Ness on the left side, went over to, uh, we went down to uh, Appen, Castle Stalker, which was, you know, Kelly's family's, you know, historical area, you know, their heritage, it's where her family came from. So somewhere along the left-hand side of Loch Ness um, on the highway, there's just a, well, really not really highway, like it's a country road that they call a highway, um, you know, it's just basically pull-offs. And there's a little pull off with, a, a, I don't want to say park, but it was like a few benches and, you know, tables and a little, you know, hmm. grill charcoal briquette thing for yeah, you to grill area. if you want to grill. Yeah, yeah picnic yeah, okay. area. Um, and then a trail up into the mountain. So on one side, it's Loch Ness and then highway and then, you know, steep cliff up into the mountain. Hmm. But, you know, Scott's Pine. So like pine trees that are like 100 feet tall, hmm. Um, hmm. moss everywhere. And it was... You know, Kelly wanted to stay in the car because it was kind of spitting down rain a bit. Okay. Um, so, but Liam wanted to go hiking. We go hiking a lot here. Um, and he wanted to go hiking in Scotland. So I figured, okay, fine. This is our last chance. Let's just go hiking off on the side of the road. Who knows where? Um, I couldn't even tell you what town it is. I know it was near Glen Affric area, but not exactly in Glen Affric. Um, But we just kind of got out of the car and just meandered up this hill. And uh, the... It was so lush and so green and like moss covered everything. There's, you know, water coming down the side of the mountain, washing the peat off the mountain into Loch Ness. Mm. It's just th this serene, you know, surreal, almost otherworldly feel to it. That's just kind of just there, side of the road. Um, and it was, it was really cool getting to share that with Liam. Okay. And you know, hiking in a completely different environment. It's it's just different from North America and the trails that we hike on. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, you know, just the, the mossy, spongy ground. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember taking video of it and then like, you know, like look how spongy the ground is and like explaining these things to him. Mm -hmm. We don't have mm -hmm. this stuff where we are. And just watching him get excited about different trees and different, you know, rocks and different, you know, seeds and things like that. Um, that was cool. And being able to share that with him and just be, in the middle of nowhere and have a little bit of a that's zen cool. moment. Yep. That's cool. With your kid. That's exactly. awesome. Yep. Oh, you made a really good memory for him in the process too. That is the goal. I hope. Yep. Yeah. And if not, we have it on video. There you go. And I caught him falling down. So that's always fun. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tripping up the trail. There Liam, was a- there Liam, was a... look at this view. <laughs> Liam? Liam? Where'd you go? <laughs> no, there was, there was a, a, a water, it rained the entire time we were there. So there was water, a stream, almost- <laughs> quasi river like a violent stream coming down the mountain which you know feeds into Loch Ness as a lot of these little tiny stream uh, feeder rivers do um and he wanted to go over and get video of it and get pictures of it and I'm like dude no you can't if you go if you fall in there I'm gonna have to jump in after you and we're both gonna die and your mom will kill me <laughs> so no so I was literally like holding on to the back of his jacket as he's like look I want to get closer no 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 you're good enough so Yes. He got closer than That's he cool. probably should have, but it's all good. That's cool. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. We're going to do some content based on his trip in the future. So yep. you can look for that. Absolutely. In a little while. And the, oh, the other coolest thing that I got, I got to see before it was released to the world outside of the trade show. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh, I think, I think, I think I know what this is. The Glen Affric Tartan, Scotland's oldest tartan. This is it. So, dun, 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 dun. yep. And we ordered this. This is for a customer. Um, I can't read without my glasses. Who the heck is this for? Preston Evans. So, your your kilt for your or your material for your kilt is here. Um, everyone else who's ordered, they ran out immediately. <laughs> so we're mm -hmm. waiting on uh, uh, we're waiting on the next shipment of or 
you know, uh, run of them to do the cloth for mm -hmm. a lot of the kilts. There's been a huge, huge, mm -hmm. huge, you know, yep. surge yep. for this particular tartan. So demand has yes. exceeded supply, which we kind of predicted might happen, but they were like, oh, yes, no, so we'll just we'll give it a try, see what happens. Like, mm -hmm. so you need to do more. We really should do this yeah. Yeah. more. We wouldn't be cocky enough to say we knew that it was going to go, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. It did. I like the fact that yes. you, you hiked in a place which is exemplary of why we have the extant specimen that that tartan recreates. Yep. That that peat is exactly why it was preserved. Yep. And, and that's the, why and the dyes are preserved. So correct. And that's why Loch Ness is when you're when you're actually floating on Loch Ness or in your boat on Loch Ness and you look down, it looks black. Mm -hmm. Like it is black, black. When you get closer to the shore and you can see like the, the through the water down to the, the pebbles and the sand below it. It looks more like tea. It's it's kind of, but it's like that darker color. And the the boat captain explained the reason why is because the rain coming off the mountains is just washing the peat into Loch Ness, and that's yeah. why it has that tea kind of color to it. Mm -hmm. and it looks black from above. Yep. So the most the most metal of locks. It's black and it has a monster in it. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Cool. Loch Ness. That's gonna be my metal band name. <laughs> Very good. All right. Miss Emma, what do we got going on there in the interwebs? Yeah, yeah, we've got lots of questions. Um, one from Brian Taylor is, how do you make an eight-yard kilt for a person with a 29-inch length? Do you need to use eight yards of double-width cloth? It, wow. it depends on the mill. So most cloth from, the, well, I should say, not say most. I should say cloth from the mills that we get in Scotland is between 54 and 60 inches wide. So if you are uh, in for an eight yard kilt, you order four yards of cloth, you you know cut it down the middle, flip it over, boom, you have eight yards. And you use a little bit in the middle. So if it's a 24 inch kilt, 24 inches and 24 inches is 48. You rip it, you have six inches left to make the waistband and the other bits that you need. Um, now, some mills are 54 inches, some are 55, some are 60 inches wide on a bolt of cloth. So if you are 28 inches times two is 56 is the minimum you need for the length of the kilt plus a bit for the waistband. If you're, if you're getting a 60 inch wide piece of fabric, then you should have enough. If you are, if you're getting a 54 inch wide, nope, it's not gonna be enough. The maximum you can do is 57. Then you'd have to cut a chunk up the end and splice it together to make a, a waistband and then flip it and hope that it matched up. Mm. Um, the other option that you have is a mill like House of Edgar who weaves single width cloth. So if you do, okay. uh, and this is for, if you have a choice of tartans, then this is what you would do, would be order something like House of Edgar single width cloth for you know Gordon Modern or whatever it is. And then, cause that cloth actually comes 32 inches wide. So 28 inches, chop it, I'd have four inches to play with for a waistband, which is plenty. You need generally about two, two and a half inches for a waistband. Mm -hmm. um, so if, let's say you want um, one of uh, the Glen Affric Tartan, comes double width from House of Edgar, 55 inches wide, and you want it to be 28. Yeah, if it has to be 28 and you can't cheat it at 27, then Yes, you're going to have to order, or the kilt maker is going to have to order eight inches single width of the, or excuse me, eight yards double width of the cloth and have a lot of wastage. Um, wow. Now, in the case of like Glen Affric, if you specifically, or a tartan where there's a lot of things, a lot of people, you know, clamoring after it all at the same time, if you can hook up with somebody else who's maybe short, maybe needs a 22 inch kilt, there you, go. Um, you can maybe you know, do it at the same time and save yourself some money. But if you're looking for, you know, a 28 inch kilt and it's in a, a random tartan that's only available double width and no one else needs it, needs the other half of the bolt or the other you know, third of the bolt, it, it can be done. It's just going to cost stuck. a bit more. You're essentially adding another 40, 50% to the cost of the kilt because it's, you know, you're double the amount of cloth which is almost half the cost of the kilt. So another 50%. Yeah. Oofta. Yep. But so hopefully you have a use for it, like pillowcases mm -hmm. or, you know, 
long, long, long table runner or mm-hmm. making rope. I don't know. <laughs> it's a long, long chunk of cloth. So Tartan compression straps. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So that would be my thoughts on it. Do you have anything to add? No. Okay. Yeah. I'm just a clothes horse. I don't make kilts. Fair. So. Yeah. Yep. So good luck. Either look for somebody or find a cloth that is single width at 32 inches wide. That's your best bet. Uh, yep. Cool. Eric. What? Okay. Right. Um, I knew about this question. I forgot to do homework on it, which I wanted to do. So I'm going to screw this up, but I will have to think improvisationally. Chuck Marks gives us a, an interesting poser. This is this should be a fun one. Imagine you're sitting at a peat fire with a dram or a pint. It's relaxing. And across from you, on the other side of the fire, are two chairs. Now visualize who is sitting in those chairs. One would be a currently living person of Scottish heritage. The other is the spirit of a deceased person brought back for this special evening of conversation. Who are they? Hmm. Oh, and Chuck wanted us to give a shout out for the uh, the upcoming 59th Phoenix Scottish Games, March 1st through 3rd. Go to the Scottish Games if you're in Phoenix. Be there or be square. Yeah. So anyway, back in the moment. Yes. <sighs> so who would I want to... Who? What a, two? A, a, living and yeah. a dead. Living and a dead. Just to chew People the, what chew I the fat wanna... with. Chew the fat with. I, and they're going to converse with each other? It's think, not like the ghost can, can only see that. me. Okay. I think we can assume that. Okay. I got it. Um, <laughs> here's what I want. No, you can only see the living one. Exactly. And they think you're freaking weird. <laughs> like, why are you talking to yourself? Can't you see them? They're right there. Can't you see Robert Burns right there? I see him. Um, okay. okay. The I, I've been told I go to the well of the Sobieski Stewarts too often, so I won't say Sobieski Stewarts. Come on. The... I would way too hard. No, 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 no. It's I wouldn't. I would. I'll. I'll geek out on the on the businessy stuff. Okay. In it. Okay. Um. So I'll leave the historical figures for yourself. Um. What I would do is I would want to see. I would want to have the owner slash proprietor slash whatever of Wilson's Bannockburn, the owner of the mill, who hopefully I'm. I don't know the entire history of it. So I'm assuming that one of them, whoever it was, was alive from 1820s and working at the mill from 1820s to 1860s. So height of the tartan craze, you know, the the King's visit to Scotland, the whole thing kicked off, boom, and right through the craze. Mm -hmm. So I want to see that person as well as um, the, the head of one of the current mills in Scotland. Now, uh, Simon Cotton owns House of Edgar, but he just bought it. So I'd say like either Blair McNaughton from House of Edgar, who ran the mill for, you know, successfully for quite a long time, or mm-hmm. Dawn from La Caron, uh, or John Buchan, who owned La Caron that was in his family before it was sold in the early teens of two th- 2000 teens. Okay. So current mill with a lot of knowledge of the mill and the trends over these past 30 years, 40 years, and then something from the 1820s to 1860s mill knowledge of the path of that 30, 40 year period. And then I would geek out with them on the, the trends in colors, the trends in designs, how the customers interacted, kind of like the blending of customer and commerce so, or, or heritage and culture and commerce, how the designs evolved, why they evolved, mm-hmm. how the customers informed the mills of their preferences, how the mills picked their own designs and kind of pushed it forwards to the culture and how what things worked, what things didn't, um, the fashion trends of the times, and then compare and contrast and watch them, those two, you know, the, the mill heads, compare and contrast those things and then pepper them with questions the entire time. That yeah. would be a pretty awesome historical slash contemporary discussion. That sounds great. Yes. That Damn, sounds now very I want good. it to happen. That's very good. Very good. I need to kidnap Dawn from La Caron and then travel on a time machine and make this occur. Dun, 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 dun. And, and a videographer to record. You have it. a time machine. I have a picture to prove. You have a, access to a TARDIS, remember? Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What would your 
And Emma, I'm going to come to you on this too. I I was <laughs> going like, to I was going to think harder about this and I totally forgot to do so. So, um but I have a I have a couple of options that come to mind. Number 1. See where this is going. As soon as I say it. Mel Gibson and William Wallace just to watch William Wallace punch Mel Gibson out. I was going to swear by this side. I shouldn't. Okay. Okay. Just going to see what William Wallace deck Mel Gibson. But that wouldn't be much of a conversation. But would he It'd deck be fun. him? Would he deck him? Now, does the real William Wallace have access to in your scenario? Ha- yes. will, will Will we have allowed him to watch Braveheart? Yeah, I think we'd have to. Yes, that's so, true. There has to be. Bring him over. There. Yeah. Back uh, from the dead. Little, I mean. little seance, Ouija board, whatever we got. And then mm-hmm. bring him back. Sit him in front of a Blu-ray. Yep. Here you go. Watch it. No, like full movie theater experience. Right, right. And then right. bring in Mel Gibson to discuss mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the choices okay. that were made. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's not as funny as I was hoping it would be. No. Wait till not. we Photoshop it, though. It's fair. Sorry. It's fair. All right. So here, no, a little bit more serious. Uh, Billy Connolly and Robert Burns. Just okay. to see the two of them, like, be witty with each other and go at it just you know over over some drinks that yeah. would be amazing now would billy Connolly be like banana booted billy colony B- billy Con- colony <laughs> billy Connolly. um yes the big no, i think i'd want I, I think i'd want him like the ag is now but minus the parkinson's or whatever okay because i want i want his advice i want his perspective as an older man and an accomplished comedian and a man of the world, I think, because he's a very wise person. He, he really is. is, and very compassionate. I want, I, I'd want him interacting with Robert Burns at his peak. You know, because yeah. unfortunately, peak Ra- mental facility. Ra- Rabbi Burns yeah. did not live very long. So, nope. what, 27 so, but, was it? 26? Yeah, heard the, yeah early Something 30s. Like I forget, but yeah, um, I think it was early 30s. But yeah, okay. so so I think that would be awesome. That'd be awesome. And then I would like to, uh, I would have. Uh, uh, some modern. Who's that? Who's that historian who does the the docs for the BBC? Who's Scottish and he's got the black hair. He's very sexy and always talks like this because now we know that this actually happened. I love the, I love the very notion of the great depth of history. What the hell is his name? I th- I think I know, you know who what I'm talk- talking about. Oh, you're asking me for a okay. celebrity issue. I want to have him no. interviewing just about anybody. Okay. You know. Okay. Could be, could be anybody. But just have him actually talking to somebody that, from any period in history, basically. Rob Roy. Okay. Yeah. I still want to talk to the Sobieski Stewarts. I don't care. <laughs> I want to interview them and go through their okay. entire catalog okay. and see. I, I want to hook them up to a lie detector. I want to go full police CSI on this. <laughs> I want to go through the entire thing. I want more evidence about the Sobieskis. I'm, no, forget it. I'm gonna, here's, I'm going to go even more. I okay. want to put the Sobieskis. Sobieskis. I'm going all dead people. Mm-hmm. Sobieskis, Sir Walter Scott, both in their prime, cage match. Yeah. Oh, two Sir Walter Scotts, just to okay. you know, even it out, because there's two of them, okay. two of them. Okay. Fine. Cage match okay. on Scottish Tartans. Celebrity death yes. match. Yes, celebrity death match. Mm-hmm. Scottish Tartans. Epic rap battle would be good, too. Ooh, I would like to see an epic mm-hmm. rap battle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Victorian epic rap battle. <laughs> Oof. All right. Uh, Emma. Yeah. Emma. Do you have any... Save me from my horrible answers. Uh, yeah, I'm about to come at you with uh, some worse answers for sure. Um, <laughs> Wait, no, we want your... No, no, no. She said okay. worse my, answers. My, my oh, some worse answers. Very okay. bad answers. Uh, living person. I um, think I'm going to go with David Tennant. Right? He's Scottish? Yeah. Only for the reason it's my time to shoot my shot. I think I have a chance if we met. Um, I'll let your boyfriend know. <laughs> very kind of you. He, he, story... he would have to understand. I mean, uh, come yeah. on. It's David. It's Tennant. a hall pass. It's yeah. fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, historic figure. Uh, I'm not super into, um, as as much into the history. It's, it's always something that I'm learning, so I don't have a fantastic answer. Okay. I think I'm going um, Robert the Bruce. 
Okay. Cancel me if you want. I have a tiny frog on my desk that I've named Ribbit the Bruce. Oh. And I'd like to snap a picture of him holding it. And I'd be like, <laughs> bye. You can turn into dust. That would be cool. Those are my two answers. So the, uh, the entirety <laughs> of your discussion <laughs> with Robert the Bruce <laughs> is to hand him your little frog. Little plastic tiny frog. plastic frog from a kinder Take a egg. photo and say, return to death. I have what? nothing else for you. So Dave, where were we? <laughs> yes, sorry about that. It was, you it's, know. He would be a third wheel. I mean, yeah, I, I in, in fairness. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he would kind of ruin it, mm -hmm. the vibe. Mm -hmm. Okay. David Tennant and Robbie Burns would be good too. Can you imagine David Tennant? Yeah, they would probably doing do recitations well. with with Robbie Burns. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. make because that Because David Tennant, too. like most British actors, is you know Shakespearean training and highly highly skilled. Dressed to cool. the haggis with David Tennant. That he'd murder that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. let's call some people. Summon the haggis. Yeah. Oh! You couldn't do it. It's a very, it's a very, it's a peculiarly Scottish thing. Yeah. Okay. Get that tesseract going. Yeah. Okay. But uh, any anything no from questions? the peanut gallery? Any um, ideas? Because it got to be better ideas than mine. Uh, we've got a f not too many. Um, okay. Robert Graves says the ghost I'd want is a Pictish chief. Yeah. So they could tell me all the real history. That's yeah. actually good. Yeah. That's better than that. That's kind of that's kind of like I've always wanted to talk to like people who actually worked in like the shipyards and and things like that, like who built some of the industrial revolution stuff, you know. So it's like I I was trying to think of an actual name person, not an abstract. I was like, yes, I think that yeah, freaking brilliant. Yeah, we went we went names. We didn't go at well. No, I kind of went abstract ish, but you know, a, a directive mm -hmm. abstract. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of the pick this thing because there's it's nothing perfect. known about it. And there's more known than people. <clears throat> really well, think actually but still there's a lot we don't know there there's much more that we don't know than we do know mm -hmm. um and if yep. the let's let's i'm going to caveat that and say pick this 100 great answer um but they have to have like the 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 google translate pick this to english so that we can we can understand what they're saying because i would go. love to know more about that i, I want to know what all the symbols mean i think we have to assume that that language is not a barrier Yes. We have a universal translator yeah. at work here, yeah. so we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very I good. like that one. That's yeah. a good one. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Dang, Nabbit, I'm going to be thinking up new ideas. Like at three o'clock in the morning. That was you. Like, I'm going to like, her next. Ah! Oh, that was me. Yeah. We'll dub something in later that sounded better. It's fine. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent that. That was I know, a great right? one. Yep. Yep. All right. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna double whammy yeah because I got a quick one. Um, okay, no whammies. From a bagpiper Phil, he's asked a few times now. He wants to know if you needed an international driver's license when you went to Scotland because he's going, and and wants to know if you needed one. Sure. Um. No. The. Uh, <clears throat> they give you a temp I, thing, don't they? No. No. Nope. You just uh, we booked it online with Avis, I think it was. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple points. One. No, you don't need an international driver's license. You do need your driver's license, but you don't need international. Um, two, uh, be a little leery of the insurance that you buy through like hotels.com or whatever. Um, they, the guy from Avis pointed out to me, well, if you, you know, if you get their insurance, then you have, this isn't a commercial for Avis, I promise. Uh, I'm not being sponsored. I should be. Uh, son of a bitch. Call me Avis. Um, the uh, if you get the insurance through a third party, then you have to deal with the whole thing, but you have to pay Avis up front. It's more. I didn't just do that back and forth. Um, but the uh, no, you don't need an international driver's license. The uh, the one thing that the thing I found most amusing is in the cars they have on the drivers and the passenger side. Drive on left with arrow pointing the other direction. For, that. for both of it, yeah. Like wow. stupid tourists are going to be stupid. Um, no, so no, you don't need a, a driver's license or a, a special driver's license. Um, the the one thing I will warn you about is more than, and I actually interviewed people talking about this, more than 50% of the cars in the UK are manual. They don't use uh, automatics nearly as much as we do. Uh, and when you go to rent, Automatic is definitely an upcharge. Now I knew how to drive manual, so I don't mind doing it. Um, but you're driving, you know, manual stick shift with your left hand driving on the right hand side of the road. 
Um, the gearbox is mm -hmm. the same direction mm -hmm. as it is in America. So first, second, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Um, it's not quite that big of a gearbox, but you get the point. Um, so that you don't have to worry about. Uh, it's not reversed the same way that your your seat is reversed and the side of the road is reversed. But uh, yeah, it's they drive a lot more manuals than we do over here. It's something I found a little bit odd and fun. Mm -hmm. Did but, you have a fun car? Um, sure, it's a fun car. It it, it wasn't yeah. anything like right. super spectacular. All their cars are very a lot smaller okay. than you know cars in the U.S. Their parking their parking spaces are are a lot smaller, so you got to be a lot more careful. Mm. Um, and their roads are a lot smaller and things like that. But yeah, but no, it's it's fun. It's fine. You'll be good. Just remember. You know, you're, you're going to often try to get in the wrong side of the car and then go back around. Um, and just, you have to remember, okay, when I'm at an intersection, I have to look to my right to see if there's any, you know, cross traffic, you know, or if you're going to make a right hand turn. Yeah. It's, 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 it's backwards, but I made the shift reasonably easily. I hope you, and I hope every other tourist does as well. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. Emma, mm -hmm. next one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I've got a question here from Robert Grave. Um, he wants to know what are some Celtic love and marriage traditions um, since we're coming up on Valentine's Day? Celtic Most love and marriage traditions. Well, the, the oldest is running the gauntlet. Basically, as a suitor. Uh, and this goes for both Irish and Scottish, although the tradition is most well-preserved in the Isle of Man. Um, all of the brothers and brother-in-laws and male members of the family uh, line up in the churchyard and they each pummel the hell out of you before you can reach your bride-to-be at the end. And if you can still walk, or you know, crawling is sometimes permitted, it depends on what region you're in, uh, by the time you reach the end, um, then you're allowed to get married. Eric, ladies and gentlemen, peak performance. Don't listen to a word this man says. You you almost had me for a little bit. I know. Almost had I me. Know. I'm like, I've never heard hey, this Hey, it's been shit. a long time really? since I indulged in that, okay? All right. Don't believe a word. Don't you love the account. image, though? You're like, poof. Welcome to the family, lad. You know, it's just like. See, where you lost me was the, it wasn't just the bride's family. Mm -hmm. If it was just the bride's like brothers and father who was allowed to beat you, it's not much of a gauntlet. I mean, I'm thinking like six to a dozen understood. guys. You know, uh, yeah, understood. But you know, your family. I don't know. They. I think my brother would fit, would defend me. Hmm. He would try to help. Uh, well, see, if you went into that, like you know, you see, your family's allowed see, to help. This push is you why. Along. This is what happened with the rough wooing when Henry VIII went after a Scottish bride, and it turned out that they brought all of their family along, and it became a whole war. Okay, so seriously, um, <clears throat> wasting your time with that goofiness. Yes. Um, symbols. <sighs> symbols or customs and stuff. There's a yes. lot. Um, Luckin' Booth, brooch, or Luckin', 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 you know, the, Luckin', the, yeah, Luckin', Luckin Booth, booth. Mm -hmm. brooches. Um, you know, or any jewelry. Exactly. Well, not just any jewelry. You got well, the clotta. Okay. No, the, no a second, Pete. No, I was saying any kind of jewelry with a Luckin' Booth design on it. Correct. Yes. A Luckin booth is a locked booth in Scotland, in Edinburgh. That's where it originated. Um, a man would buy it and then, you know, give it to his betrothed. And that was a symbol of their love. When they got married and had a kid, they would pin it on the baby's little blanket and walk them around. Yeah, it was basically, it was basically, they called them locked booths because those were the, um, the booths used by jewelers at uh, market fairs. So it was yep. a way of keeping their stock secure. And some, at some point, somebody got in the habit of saying, you know, we're just going to sell these special tokens and you have to buy it from them directly and is usually silver um and they got the nickname of looking booth because that's where you had to go to buy one yep and then there's the clada mm -hmm. or as mac would say clada as a throwback for you <laughs> the uh <clears throat> no the clada brooch or, or excuse me clada ring started in ireland um yep. there is a uh an an evolution of the meaning of you know it's uh but uh with this with my hands, I hold my heart and crown my love or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's 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 loyalty, love, and friendship. Right. Are the three symbols within it. Right. Um the uh but it's it's 
taken on a meaning at some point. It, it, it has to be marketing stick from mm -hmm. somewhere. That mm -hmm. if you wear it on your right hand facing away versus towards you, and then in your left hand away versus towards you, it means single versus dating versus engaged, engaged versus, versus married. married. Correct. Yeah. So it took on meaning over time. That's not how it started. So at some point, there was some kind of marketing or story that went with it. I will neither endorse nor deny uh, the story. If memory serves, Captain. Um, the uh, last, it's been a while since I looked into this, but as the last I heard, the tradition of the wearing of the ring and how you wore it may actually have been a, invented by Irish immigrants to the United States. Okay. So it goes back to the early 20th century is, is the best guess. If I remember correctly, I would want to double check this. Um, the uh, there are various legends about the ring itself that the, that it's named after the village where the jeweler who started selling it uh, came from. And the one legend is that the guy who invented it was actually um, he was betrothed to this girl. He was sailing somewhere, and he got, his ship was attacked by Moorish pirates. He wound up in servitude in Morocco and uh, was trained as a silversmith in the household of this guy who bought him. And then when he won his release, he went back to uh, the village of Clada and set up his own silversmithy um, and was able to then reunite with his uh, loved, beloved and start up a family and a business and stuff. And it took off from there. Probably just legend. Um, the Clada is based on um, hand fastening type rings of which you can see similar designs that go all the way back to the Roman Empire. So the idea of uh, rings that have two hands clasping is actually pretty ancient. Um, I think are the, they clasping or just no on the claw that they're holding a heart, but in yeah. most in most of um, I forget the name of it. Damn it! Um, You've done great actually, so far. They're actually clasping hands, like a handshake. Right, right, right. So and it was a symbol of betrothal um, okay. or a contract or whatever or friendship. So when I think of this kind of stuff, obviously I think that the big one that comes to mind is hand fasting, which uh, a lot of people are into. Nowadays, um, the history of where it comes from is a little bit muddied. Um, it was not, in fact, a betrothal for a year and a day. Um, it was, there are different kinds of marriages in medieval to Renaissance period Scotland and Ireland before, uh, in Scotland before the rise of the Presbyterian Church, who basically put a kibosh on everything. Um, but there were different kinds of engagement uh, arrangements. And uh, a hand fasting was literally just a handshake agreement saying, yep, we'll get married at some point. And uh, there's a lot more to it than that. We're going to do some content on it, so I'm not going to spill the beans on it now. But um, the idea that it is a traditional marriage kind of marriage ceremony is actually more of a modern invention, especially using the whole cord thing. Um, it's still super cool, um, but it's not like some ancient... Celtic pagan tradition. It's not. Sorry. Um, is that where tying the knot came from? It is. But that but that is again not as old as people think. Right. Okay. Um what else am I gonna say about it? Yeah, I mean, marriage by elopement was a big deal. Uh the blacksmith in your village could marry you. Uh up again, up until the Presbyterians, you know, put the kibosh on all that stuff. After he hammered out a ring. Yeah, you did not have to go, you did not have to have a priest um for a lot of history. Uh, you just have to have a witness, and a blacksmith was typically the guy. And there's one village in Scotland that people would go to. They would elope to, and I can't remember the name of it now. But uh, little things like that uh, is is very very common. Insert village name here. Yeah, sorry guys, this is a, there's a yeah, lot. It's of all good. Listexia gets to me sometimes. Hey, I just don't you, you, so. you rattled off. The, I, I remembered the uh, the. Yeah, but I want to be more precise. I understand, but we're live, dude. It's tough to remember all this stuff. All right. Recall, it's dude. People out there in the interwebs, recalling all of these facts. I am more impressed with Eric than you know of the entire story of the Clada. I knew what you were saying about the guy who was, you know, uh, enslaved and taken away, but I didn't mm -hmm. remember, you know, Morocco. I didn't like. <laughs> Okay. You got a lot more facts than I got. Thank you. My favorite, though, if you're talking about tokens, is actually Welsh love spoons. Um, that's a tradition, a tradition that 
goes back to the Welsh maritime uh, traditions. Uh, so like 18th century, I'm pretty sure, maybe earlier. And they still do that today. Um, nowadays, most people just buy them by, from craftsmen as a decorative item, you know, but they are amazing. And, and some of the <clears throat> historical examples are just phenomenal. And the idea that you needed to uh, make one of these things as a traditional love token to somebody you were interested in saying, I, I, you want while date? you're on you the want ship. date? Yeah. yeah. While you're on the ship, um, while you're on the job. And it, the theory was it showed that you were patient. It showed that you were skilled um, and you were serious because these are things that are not necessarily easy to carve. So I thought that was pretty cool. I've always thought Welsh love spoons don't get as much attention as they deserve. The I, I liken Welsh love spoons to trench art. Mm -hmm. as well as to uh, Scrimshaw yep. Yep. Um, for sailors and, you know, up yep. in the uh, uh, yep. New England area. It's true. Yeah. It's true. There, there's a lot of really cool, like, hey, if you're on a ship or if you're in a trench and you're waiting for something to happen, like, what do you do? You got to do something with your time. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. art is a great way to do, you know, pass mm -hmm. the time. Yep. So it's it's a neat, you know, kind of uh, uh, parallelism there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So there's there's a lot of food traditions too, but I'm not thinking of any good ones off the top of my head. But yeah, it's a good. We should do some content on that. Indeed, we have done some. We did, but it was ages ago. Yeah, it's we'll time do for more. time for an update. Yes, how dare you get on that? Sorry, sir. Yes, Cut, sir. Come. Make it happen. Start carving that spoon. Go. All right, Eric. My turn. Yes, okay. I think so. Um. Okay. And then Japan, Christmas is when you have romantic dates, not Valentine's Day. But anyway. Um, Doesn't St. Nick make a weird third wheel? I, I don't know. It's romantic to them. Why'd you bring this fat bearded guy? Annual, annual gift giving man. Ah, um, Jeff Plavier, or Plavier, I don't know how you pronounce it, says, based on the feedback at the store and from the Kilts and Culture group, do you folks at USA Kilts feel there is a higher interest or participation in Burns Night this year over previous years? In short, do you think the interest is truly growing in this or other Scottish events? And I'll say events or traditions. Are we in an upswing? I think it, it's t it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, we are you know you know kindly invited um, to to several Burns nights. So I know that there are several ish within a hour or two drive of us. Um, and I've I've seen several within our kilts and culture group mm -hmm. that have occurred and things like that. Um, and I think post COVID, there's exactly. definitely been a a drive, a desire, a, a need to reconnect personally with people and to have events, public events, where you know you get to have fun um, in a large group, yep. unmasked. Yep. Um, so I think there's there's definitely been a trend towards it. Will that continue? 10 years from now, who knows? Um, I think with Ancestry.com, there's probably been a bit more of an influx over the past five, 10 years of people wanting to Perhaps. get in touch with their heritage. And then mm -hmm. once they find out, ooh, I'm part Scottish, what can I, what, what does that mean? What can I do? How can I celebrate that? Then they figure out about Haggis and then they go, ooh, okay, when can I have Haggis? Oh, wait, Burns Night. That's a good excuse. Mm -hmm. And they just, they find, they want to find an excuse to celebrate. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. any excuse for a party is a good excuse right basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> so i think overall there's probably some kind of pull towards uh culture and partying and you know wanting to express heritage um i don't know how much more in the past you know few years versus 10 years versus 20 years mm -hmm. do you have a sense of it i think it's gone both ways so I think I think what COVID did was um, it increased people's desire to get out and do things again as soon as they could. An so appreciation more, I, for getting out. Yes. 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 Uh, heightened appreciation. Um, and I think that at the same time, more people got inspired to do things that they could do at home. Those, you know, few years ago during all the lockdowns. So I think there was a huge uh, groundswell of uh, at home burn suppers, private parties that people were doing. Um, just like, you know, bread baking became a huge hobby during COVID. Um, I think that things like Burns Light, you know, and, and doing home crafty, homespun, rustic, um, feel good, warm, fuzzy kind of stuff like that got a big shot in the arm. And I think that's continued. 
I see more people post about how they're making their own burn suppers at home, mm -hmm. you know, or they're having a burn supper and just inviting a few friends over. Um, so I do think, yes, the, the public events have definitely come back. Um, and I think that uh, at the same time, people are doing more stuff at home. I think that's the thing I see in terms of interest in cultural stuff like burn supper. It's, 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 there's more interest in the craft side of it is what I've noticed. It's not, it's not just the socialization, but it's more, inter more interest in DIY stuff. I just thought of a way for us to gather empirical evidence okay. that I, I didn't think of till just now. Huh. We could call the Scottish Gourmet and see, if their see what their increased. sales of haggis point. is or have if they have increased over the last eight years from you know then to now in January. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. All right. I'll, I think that's a great. I'll that's figure it out. Yeah, it's 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 an easy, simple way to do it. And we have access mm -hmm. to them. They're mm -hmm. good people. Yeah. So. I'll insert that here. So I just got off the phone with Ann at Scottish Gourmet USA. And I got some data for us. 2024 was their biggest year ever for haggis sales. They think, they, they know, check that, that absolutely more people are holding in-home haggis Robert Burns suppers. And they know that through individual small order sales. And also more people are holding large events and going to large events because they're selling more to larger organizations as well. Um, the trends over time, uh, 2018, they were up 18% 29 in January haggis sales, 2019 up 16%, 2020, they were up 3%. Then 2021, it obviously fell off with the pandemic and no one being able to go to events. Um, but it came roaring back in 2022, big dinners, uh, were up 33, uh, excuse me, haggis sales were up 33%. 2023, they were, uh, above 2019 numbers, they were up 21%. And this year, January of 2024, they were up 17%, which puts them well above 2020 numbers. They are back on track. 100% Americans love burn suppers and they love haggis. But I would say, I would say in some ways we are in an upswing in cultural interest. And I've said before that basically I think it's because uh, the more high tech life gets, the more people want some kind of a sense of something real and natural and analog. Yep. So uh, I think there's more interest in everything we talk about here because of that alone. Um, it's not dehumanizing. It's not cookie cutter culture. It is something you can really sink your teeth into and you can share it with loved ones and family and um, and pass on your kids and it just feels really real. So I think we are absolutely seeing an upswing in interest in all of this stuff. In a weird way, technology is feeding it. Yes. It's 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 this weird yes. monster that technology is making us more individual and going into our own you know echo chamber bubbles, mm -hmm. and on the other end, it's making us want to connect more analog and more visceral you know physical yeah. you know, interactions. But we're finding more data and more people and more geekdoms and more friends through communities online, which is then feeding our mm -hmm. our knowledge base. Yep. And then we go out and physically, you know, interact with each other in the real world mm -hmm. because we have that need as well as humans. And 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 more material to work with. I mean, the Glen Afric Tartan is a perfect example of that. And I know I have a question here about that that we'll get into later. But um, what we can do with that tartan and know about it now is vastly superior to what we could have learned about it just 10 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. You know, so... You mean this Glen Afric Tartan? I mean that Glen Afric Tartan. Right Available there. at usakilt.com. <laughs> quick I'm aside. I'm going to keep it off to the side, make sure I don't spill whiskey on quick it. Quick aside, if you are interested in getting it, I personally highly recommend that you do a pre-order now because, um, again, demand has exceeded supply, and I fully expect personally that when the new supply is available, it's going to run out Oh, I think it's fast. already gone. It may already the, be gone. It yeah. may already be the mill more, basically so. the mill came out with a new collection. They're eighteen mm -hmm. or seventeen eighty four or something, some number collection. Um, and Glen Afric was like the headliner, and they did one hundred twenty meters of it. Of course, sold it out immediately. Um, sorry, snap with the right hand. It's a better snap. Um, sold out immediately, and then did another, put another two hundred forty meters into production. And I think that's, I've been ordering so much in the last few days. That's probably either gone or almost gone. Yeah. So there's going to have to be, you know the next one and that one was uh, estimated mid-march and that was pretty much the majority of their yarns that they were using mm -hmm. were 
depleted at that point. So I'm 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 going to guess that they're going to quote end of April for the third run of the thing. So yeah, if you yeah. want it, you know, speak soon. Not forever hold your peace, but you're going to have to hold your peace a lot longer. Yeah. There you okay. go. Sorry for the tangent. Yeah. But, or rabbit hole. Or rabbit no, it's, it's, a, it's a popular target and people want to know about but it. But the point is it's the result of technology. Yes. 100%. And yet it's 500 years old. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Was that you or Emma? That was or me. Emma? All right. That was long. Yeah. Oh, well, we're long winded. Before we get to Emma's next question, since it's 359, we should probably do the Ambassador of the Month. Hey guys, we thought it'd be fun to highlight a couple this time in honor of the season. So our ambassadors today are Robert and Samantha Nunn of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Sam works as a lead teller at a bank and Robert is in maintenance. He's also a vet with eight years in the army and a deployment to Iraq under his belt. These lovebirds met by chance in college back in 2011. Rob is mostly of Irish descent with some Ulster Scots in the mix. He has family ties to County Antrim, County Donegal, and County Kildare. And like many immigrants of the past two centuries, some of his ancestors merely had Ireland listed as their place of origin. Sam, meanwhile, says the majority of her ancestry is German, but she is also very proud to be able to claim distant Irish and Scottish ancestry, including a great-grandfather from County Tyrone. The two of them agree that heritage is a way to feel like you are a part of something bigger, and for them, things like music, language, and handicrafts are very, very important. The key is to add different traditional elements to both everyday life and to family holidays. Rob says, We both look forward to teaching our first child all about his heritage. He's due late spring of this year. We purchased storybooks for him from Germany, Ireland, and Scotland and can't wait to read them to him. We're working on making a kilt for him as well. Wouldn't want him to feel left out now, would we? These guys have a lot of hobbies, and they love to travel. Rob says Ireland is his happy place, for instance. For her part, Sam loves experiencing her ancestral lands and has found a few awesome ways to bring that back home. She's into genealogy, loves cooking old world recipes, and this is extra cool. She is planting a heritage garden with flowers from Germany, Ireland, and Scotland. Kind of love that. Rob, meanwhile, is passionate about Celtic music and especially Irish rebel tunes. He's currently taking boron lessons. Another passion of his is sailing. He has a small boat of his own, and he's crewed the A.J. Meerwald, New Jersey's own tall ship. Rob and Sam got their first kilts together on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. It was 2018 and their very first time visiting the U.K. and Ireland. Their love of the kilt is sort of an outgrowth, really, of their love of clothing in general. You see, the pair have done Renfair costuming for some time and are also avid Trekkies. They have a great collection of uniforms. I admit I'm a tad jealous. And yes, Rob fully intends to go full-on Scotty and create a kilted dress uniform in the near future. Both Rob and Sam are sewers. Rob has actually hand-sewn most of his own kilts, and he's done a few for the wife as well. Impressive enough, but get this, Rob also made his very first kilt pin in a home-built forge. He also built a four-shaft loom and used that to weave a scarf in his family tartan. As he says, professions of the past make for extremely rewarding hobbies. When it comes to kilts, Sam says, Kilts are a great conversation starter. The fit and the flare look gives a great shape. I also love making matching accessories for a more complete look. And I love showing off my colors, be it my German heritage tartan kilt, our family tartan kilt, or any of the others in between. As you've probably guessed, Sam and Rob really believe in going full steam ahead into whatever feeds your soul. In their words, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Embrace life. And in a relationship, remember that all things come together for good. Even the bad contributes to the good because you are building a fulfilling life together. So Sam and Rob are two of the most delightful young people I've met in a long time. Uh, I've had the chance to meet them at our company anniversary party last spring, in fact. And I just want to say we could all do better to follow their example. Go out there and actually do something that really feeds your soul. Thank you, Rob and Sam, for the inspiration. Keep it up. You're on a great path. Here's to Mr. Nunn and his wife. The Cheers. nuns. The nuns. The yes. nuns and their nunnery. All of them. The nuns. All soon to be three of them. Indeed. That's Quite. cool. Yeah. yeah. He's a very, very nice guy. And Local guy. Local-ish. Grew yeah, up. Yeah. He, he lives right near where I grew up in Sellersville. Really? Yep. I didn't realize that. Yep. Okay. But I just, uh, Emma was saying that I, didn't, I knew he was taking boron lessons. I didn't realize uh, he was taking them from 
from Matt. Matt. Yeah. Our, our, our Matt uh, Tartan, Tartan expert resident sales guy downstairs. One of the one of the the crew, one of Emma's. It's a great crew. title. I didn't realize Tartan that. resident expert. Remember, it's like what was it like Tartan consultants? Guy. I have no idea. What we we had a title for people working on. The Emma, sales what's your team. title? Uh, secondary marketplace coordinator, but I'm special. Secondary. I, I go with customer service specialist. Customer service specialist. Okay. Because she works for our, she does our Etsy as well as Amazon stuff. Okay. So secondary so marketplace. CSS. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. They're they're wonderful yeah. humans, all of them. They really are. Yes, they really are. And including the nuns. So to bring it back around. All right. All right. Is it my turn now? No, Emma. My turn. It's Emma's you, turn. You I'm sorry. I'm just... How dare you step over? You know, our I got all these questions, Emma. and we keep talking. And... I know. We'll okay. shut the hell up. Go okay. ahead, Emma. All righty. Uh, so, got a question from David Baca. <clears throat> He's Considering a great kilt for the Texas Renaissance Festival, hmm. but ter- what material would you suggest? Um, and if do we have a video for idiots? Um, he has a standard kilt, but the great kilt has him intrigued. And then he also clarified that um, in Texas, in October to November, it can vary from fifty to ninety degrees degrees all in the same day. Yep, I've heard that. So, yep. What it's material? Not quite, not quite desert conditions, but material for a great kilt in Texas in the in the summer winter. I'd go with 11 ounce wool. Yeah. Either 11 ounce wool or PV. So if it's PV 90. Will not, PV will not breathe as well or keep you quite as warm. But, but you can throw it in the wash. But you can throw it in the wash. If it gets hot. When I think of Texas, um, my only reference is mud because I have a friend who worked down there. Um, but she was more, I think, um, East Texas. And they have like a mud season down where she was. So she used to tell me these horror stories about um, all the roads shutting down because you couldn't get through, you know. But uh, so a lot of mud, uh, and I guess that would mean a lot of dust. But I don't know. Texas is a huge place, so I can't say. But I would say, I, yeah, PV maybe. But I'm a little tempted to say 11 ounce wool would be better um, for cold temperatures at night. But um, yeah, we do not have a how-to video on great kilts yet, um, and that's partially due to my lack of desire to be in my underwear on camera. Uh, but it's whereas some point where I have been on my <laughs> to great aplomb apparently and great, yes great event. yes number number one uh, TikTok video is Rocky in, un- in his underwear creeps me out on many levels creeps but... you out <laughs> um anyway I would highly recommend if you're if you are a member of the Kilts and Culture Facebook group ping some people on there um there are several great kilt wearers there and you will get the best advice on what you can do for it uh in terms of how to put it on efficiently um from them if you're camping at the festival i think that introduces other parameters into how you're going to do it versus if you are driving to the site each day so you can dress at home yeah i was gonna with the mud thing first of all my brain wouldn't stop singing primus my name is mud for the record (laughs) so i was half like you know off in another land while you were in, in primus land less claypool spectacular mm. bassist um mm-hmm. the uh but if you're if you're worried about mud and heat and washability then pv lighter weight you know 11 ounce fabric mm-hmm. if you're worried about you know a little bit warmer and or breathability and i would probably go 11 ounce wool but yeah not quite as washable mm-hmm. as pv would be mm-hmm. um so it's kind of Wool is the the fabric for all seasons, to a degree. Yeah. Um, but PV is washable and stain resistant and mud repellent. Here's the thing. Um, one of the reasons that the PV that we offer, at least, is stain resistant, is because it has a Teflon coating on it. And so we will go to great pains to advise that people who have a PV kilt do not use fabric softener, um, wash on cold, all that kind of stuff. Okay, to make sure you do not strip away that Teflon coating, uh, which is very useful. Uh, However, I never offer that advice for a great kilt because I find that the PV without some beating up in the washing process will not lay as nicely. You want a great kilt, unlike a tailored kilt, to be a mushier, softer, and to flow differently. It just flows better and flows differently the softer it gets. So I actually uh, will say, okay, for a great kilt and PV, 
go ahead the first time you wash it wash it on hot beat the hell out of it help it to loosen up soften up a little bit it's going to look better as a great kilt it's not gonna be as stiff as a great kilt um so keep that in mind that said yeah it's easily washable now the wool you let that mud dry to dust and you can shake it out you, yeah. can, you can brush it out you don't have to wash the wool um the fibers will release the dirt you can just beat it like a carpet you know shake it out and it'll be pretty good unless you're like rolling around in a mud pit next to the porta potties in which case what the hell is wrong with you um so yeah i would i would go with either the pv or a lightweight wool <clears throat> it's going to depend to some extent on what yardage of great kilt you're opting for um and how you tolerate the heat in general so i would not do the the extra yardage the way some guys do um because they want more yardage to play with for doing the over the head cloak effect and things like that uh and i would say if you are heat intolerant take that into account yeah yeah i pretty much agree yep hopefully that helps indeed was that you or emma that was emma okay eric would you regale us tj that, heron that whiskey is good it's it still really going, I, it's, I know it's still going down good yep. I, I don't want to drink coffee Super but good. i have to maintain must maintain Your alcohol caffeine level <sighs> mm-hmm. it, there's a balance there, there's a sleep deprivation caffeine alcohol you know in you know it's it's all in balance it's Get all good into things the, into the creative zone in, into the zone exactly yep Whew, that's good stuff okay. it is it's good stuff if you can get it all right so tj heron asked us a uh, kind of a classic question can you visually tell the difference between an eight yard and a five yard wool kilt can i yes can most people probably not um i i wouldn't worry too much about it honestly the um the the difference between a five and eight yard kilt is you're gonna you know see it in in two ways one you're going to see the swish of the kilt and the amount of swing in the pleats. Um, and it's the the set, whether it's the true set or the mock set um, and or the width of the pleats. If you're 99% of the people in the world won't be able to tell the difference between an eight yard kilt and a five yard kilt. So if, if money is an issue, then five yard kilt, you're fine. If money isn't an issue then get an eight yard kilt the the eight yard kilt is going to have narrower pleats because you have more fabric to play with Mm -hmm. and those pleats are also going to be a little bit deeper therefore it's going to be a little bit nicer swish as you walk um if it is a five yard kilt they're going to be a little bit wider they're going to be a little bit shallower so they're not going to swing quite as nicely but again who's going to know like most people don't understand what they're looking at if you're at a wedding and you're the only guy in a kilt. No one's going to know. Wear what you have. You're fine. If you're looking for the ideal, the pinnacle, the the, the chef's kiss of kilts, as it were, then yes, go with an eight yard kilt. Thoughts? Um, more or less the same. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're going to be going to events with a lot of other guys who are kilted, you might want to have the nicer kilt, just because um, when you have to see the two of them side by side, you can tell better. Um, and it's a matter of distance. There's sort of a inverse of a 10 foot rule, um, with, uh, with a, a kilt. I mean, you can see that the pleats are different. You can see that there's not as much swish. Um, you can see it's not splaying the same way when you, you know, when you move or bend or sit down between a five yard and eight yard. Um, but 10 feet away, your average Joe is not going to be able to tell the difference. Um, and again, if you're the only person in the room, don't worry about it. If it's a matter of having it for daily wear because you want to be a serial kilter, yeah, go with a five yard. You know, that's that's fine. So yeah, yeah, agree. That's yeah. pretty easy. Pretty much. Cool. Well, oh. you. Yes. Hey, you over there. You. You. Me over that here. Horrible monkey. All right. Uh, so we've got a Ren and Stimpy. That's no. one we haven't really gone after. That's not Ren and Stimpy. That's Invader that Zim. Oh. That's- Monkey. I still love Ren and Snippy. Ren and we got to do Ren and Snippy at some point. You All bloated right. sack of protoplasm. You bloated sack of protoplasm. <laughs> well, we got to do the Canadian kilted Mounties then. <sighs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot we of Ren and Snippy. We probably wear women's clothing. Toast. We're the Canadian. Wait, what's the toast one? Q. 
kilted yaksman. That's it. Yes. Okay. All right. Powdered toast man. Powdered toast man. Yeah. Okay. You're showing Emma. your age. Yeah. Hi, Emma. You have no idea it what the hell right. we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. I, I wouldn't know about Ren and Stimpy. I'm Welcome to the Lance. conversation, Emma. Yeah, you child. Not familiar. Um, all right. Andrew Cooper wants to know, how do you know what color jacket to wear with your kilt? So. Day or evening? Um, he didn't or what qualify. Level, what level of formality is he envisioning? Yeah, I think um, uh, he didn't. Um, we can ask him for sure. Well, then um, the I answer think... is just getting more long-winded. <laughs> Great job, <laughs> Emma. <laughs> fair. Shh. Very fair. I think uh, day wear is more interesting because how do you guys pick out tweed colors with your mm -hmm. kilts? What goes through your mind? Good save. It's almost like it's only her third time on the show. <sighs> you did Be nice. You did. Doing a great job. Be nice. Thanks. Doing Thanks. a very job. good job. Yes. <clears throat> for Jackie for formal, yeah, let's start, you know, for formal, yeah, black. Um, if you're... If you want to be a little bit over the top, potentially red, which is very over the top, or a bottle green or a navy, if you right. want to be a little bit different. Yeah. If it specifies black tie affair, then black would be the appropriate, you know, jacket. For day wear, which is the more interesting option, as Emma has pointed out, um, there's really two two ways that I tend to kind of coordinate the outfit. Um, well, three. First is the jacket to match with the hose. Forget that the kilt exists and just match the jacket to the hose and then the kilt kind of stands out on its own. Option B is the jacket, you know, the tweed that you're wearing with the jacket to tone with one of the colors in the kilt, you know, extremely well and kind of color coordinate the outfit. Americans tend to be a little bit more matchy matchy than the Scots do. Um, so that's, you know, kind of the way that we go about things. Um, option C, the Scottish way, you wear the jacket you want. It doesn't matter. You wear a, a bright green, not bright green, but you wear a, a green or a yellowish green or a bluish green tweed, and then mm -hmm. you wear the kilt that you have and you wear the hose that you want. And it's kind of a little bit more of a hodgepodge, mix and match, yeah. fun, but it all blends together bit. Yep. yep. Thoughts? Basically that. Um, I think that basically when you're just getting into this, uh, go for natural, neutral colors, grays, charcoals, browns, tans, um, because then it's just kind of natural, neutral. It doesn't matter if it matches a color in the tartan or not. But then what you realize is that some tweeds, a lot of tweeds, actually have flecks of color in them, which will be accentuated by colors in the tartan. The advantage of that is a lot of time you will find a nice tweed which actually works with more than one tartan on the assumption that you, you know, like, ha you know, you are going to have more than one kilt. Um, like this, this brown right here actually has some nice tones in it. I can make this work with either a tartan that's not going to matter. Like this one, there's, you could sort of imagine there's some brown in this, even though there isn't, but it works. Or I could make sure I'm being really matchy matchy and, you know, you can't see it, but there's like actually some greens and blues. Uh, and mustards in this tweed. Um, but there's some base browns that go perfectly with that. So that's why that's the beauty of tweed is that you can you can be really creative, you can be really obsessive. Um, but it's also very forgiving. So if you're just getting started, um, go with something neutral, like a charcoal or a gray. That's gonna be even easier than getting into browns. Uh, and if you're gonna what you have some with you? Why do you have those here? Do you not carry swatches of tartan and tweed? Excuse with me while I whip out this swatch. Of course. Um, I'll, I'll let you finish your point. Uh, yeah. Or have I distracted you sufficiently? Bastard. Um, I think the more you're talking about outerwear, the less it matters. If you're talking about a leather jacket, bomber jacket, pea coat, something that's for protective purposes, nobody cares. If you're talking about smart day wear, like tweeds, or if you're talking about semi dress, um, then there's a lot to play around with. But you start with neutrals and then work your way into brighter and brighter colors, basically. Yeah. It, tweeds run the gamut. <clears throat> yep. The beauty of tweed is that it's it's it can match, but it doesn't have to. Now, um, so these are the, the most recent addition to Martin Mills uh, ranges. I just, I don't know why I brought these Did you these talk in. about them last month or something? No, I, I have the them studio? here. I don't know why I have them. I have them. Just don't, don't question me. <laughs> the, uh, so 
they have a, these are kind of new colors. These are all essentially browns. They have a like dark chocolate, almost black brown. They have a new brown that is like bang on with freaking weathered tweed. Sorry, I'm out of the shot there. Um, here. We're going to... We're gonna do this Here with we go. ah. It's beautiful. This guy's a security there's, camera. There's my gut. Um. So, but we have that, and then there's like this, this like a little bit of a hint of blue as More well than as I green. Can see, yeah, there's blues and greens. Yeah, and... it's like a navy blue yeah. with brown kind of tweed in there. So these are just three random examples of new tweeds, and they go as much as you want them to or don't want them to. The, again, the beauty of the tweed is you can match the tartan or you can go against the grain and not match at all. That is the more yeah. historically accurate, for lack of a better term, um, way that the Scots would do it is they'll wear the the greenish, bluish, brownish, whatever, tweed with the kilt that they have. The more current trend going to the actual swatches of tartan that we have from Martin Mills are their... Their wedding slash rental slash hire industry is going for more softer kind of colors. So these are these are tweeds or, or uh, tartans that I picked up at the trade show. Um, oh, okay. Where it's they're just going for beautiful designs. So this is their Kintyre collection, which is oh, a that's why you a brought them soft. In. Yeah, it's I'm not bringing it in for a sales purpose. No, but I'm you're bringing showing it in something for, you like showing something new and what you saw at the trade show exactly. Yeah. So this one has like a little bit of purple and navy and gray in it. This one has like multiple shades of blue in it. And then they brought out tweeds to match them and tone with them. So even in Scotland, you have this, this trend towards, you know, wear whatever you have, whatever you want, doesn't have to match. And then you have trends for weddings for zennials and younger people in their 20s and early 30s who want to match who want to be fashion forward, who want to have, who don't care what the design is called. They just know that, you know, my my bride wants our colors to be, you know, blue and brown. Great. Here's one that matches that. What do you call it? You know, Scottish Midnight Barons. Cool. Scottish Midnight Pete. <laughs> don't care. Like it. Like the pattern. She likes it. You know, therefore, that's what I'm going to go with for me and my groomsmen. And then we're going to go with this tweed because it matches that one, you know, bang on. Yep. So it's a weird kind of confluence of, you know, a, a tradition of wear whatever the hell you have. And no, I want to be fashion forward and kind of move towards the more matchy matchy effect that, you know, other cultures have within it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Fa, 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 fashion. Um, yeah. So there's a lot you can do. My advice would be if you are shopping for jackets at a stewer, um, take the kilt with you or take a swatch of the tartan with you. If you are buying something custom and you're not sure, either go to the place in person so you can see the swatches they have or order the swatches of the ones you like online so you can be very sure that you feel like it looks good with your kilt um, in all kinds of light. You know, you want to see how it's going to look in sunlight and indoor lighting. Um, swatches are your friend if you're not in a hurry. You know, that's why we offer them. So that's that's a good good way to go. Basically. Yeah. Hopefully that Indeed. answers the question. Yeah, but there there are more tweed options for colors mm -hmm. than there are tartans that might fall within your color palette. So if you're gonna have to pick one first over another, I would say pick the tartan that you like most first and then move into the different color tweeds and decide whether you want a complementary color or something that tones and matches it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there, those are subtle differences, but they're different. Mm -hmm. cool. And, and for how I choose, uh, I very, very much made a point of looking at swatches of tweeds and picking some tweeds for my vests. Um, cause I have a lot more vests than jackets that I knew would go with more than one tartan. So I have a couple that are like uh, a maroon and rust kind of a color, um, that I know will go with at least two or three tartans in my collection. So just, I like that flexibility. So yeah. Now and I, cheap. and we're, we're both a bit of, uh, close horses. Um, you so think? yes, uh, as you do. Um, so, but I tend to, I tend to be a little bit more on the matchy matchy side than the 
you know, than the than the toning juxt juxtaposing side. So I don't like the the greenish yellow tweed with my you know modern tartan. I would tend to do a navies and blues or bottle greens, you know, kind of with a modern tartan than something that's more contrasty. Um, it is done. I'm not saying that I'm the right way to do it. I'm saying that's the way that I tend to do it. Um, although I also like, you know, uh, uh, Tattersall shirts and, you know, pattern mm -hmm. shirts and things like that mm -hmm. with a kilt, which is a little bit more traditional, fusty, old timey than, than tends to be. Yes. We get on to some more questions. Okay. It's getting late. Uh, fine. Sorry. Meandering. I talking about clothes. I, I nerd out about up. new tweeds and new tartans and stuff. Okay. Sorry, mom. It's my turn, right? Yes. Okay. This is a good one. Mr. Travis Bennett, in his infinite wisdom, has queried us this. <clears throat> Lately, I've seen marketing for cable knit sweaters with clan-specific knitting part patterns. Hmm. Clan-specific knitting patterns. I'm wondering whether these are a new concept or if it has deep historical roots. When did this originate? So clan or family specific knitting patterns for cable knit sweaters. We are primarily talking about Irish now. The, yes. the Irish invention of the what's often called the Aran knit sweater. <clears throat> Indeed. Um, Wait. Spoiler alert. It's marketing. Yeah. The there is uh, there there is a current push for clan specific. Like, this is the Murphy pattern, and the story right. that is spun is that oh these poor dead fishermen that washed up on shore. How they were identified was their clan sweaters. It's not true. There's there's historical evidence of a play. There was a play. There was a play. Yep, a Just play. A play. One play. Only mm -hmm. one play. In like the 19 teens or 20s. Yes. I can't remember the title right now. Exactly. Not hundreds of years old, no. a hundred years old, where a woman recognized that a sweater, one, that washed up had a couple, two, dropped stitches, which she recognized as her own work so that it was her husband who had washed up. And that is essentially it. And then that was extrapolated and said, well, that's how you identify all dead Irish fishermen who wash up on the shore, you know, 27 times a day, which how that's not voted the most like <laughs> a, a dangerous job in the world ever. Don't know. It's pretty dangerous, but yeah, apparently. But no, it is marketing. Now, that said. If you like it, if it's fun, if you, if it means something to you, great, buy it. If your name is Murphy and you come across the Murphy Irish clan pattern sweater and you're like, wow, that's a really cool looking sweater and it has my name on it, great, buy it. There is, there is a tradition, a broader tradition in, in marketing in companies of naming products names. So we have, we have bags in the store called an Emily bag, a Fiona bag. There are different, you know, companies have to give a product a name so that they differentiate it within their stock. So if my name is Emily and I walk, I look like an Emily, I know it's, mm. it's the beard. Mm. If I walk into a store and I see this tweed handbag and I go, I look at the tag and I go, oh, Emily, my name is Emily. And I happen to like that bag. Great. I might add that little bit of meaning onto my purchase of the bag because it was meant to be because my name is Emily and the bag's name is Emily and I like the tweet. Great. Wonderful. Have at it. If it means something to you, wonderful. If your name is Murphy and you like the pattern in a Murphy Irish sweater, great. Buy it. No one is stopping you from buying it, but it's not a, a, a long entrenched historical thing. It is marketing that is fun. But it is not necessarily as meaningful as people want it to be. It does not have this story. We right. are here as stewards of truth as much as we can be. And we are going to tell you it's not a real thing. If it means something to you, great. Do it. Have fun with it. Don't not do it because it's a new thing. But it's a new thing. Yep. Basically that. 
um, the the odds of you walking down the street in your Murphy sweater <laughs> and seeing somebody else who sees your sweater and says, oh, you're a fellow Murphy. I recognize your weave pattern is slim to none. Um, so, yeah, there weren't two companies in Ireland who did who came up with this stuff specifically for appealing to the tourist market. Um, the predecessor to this was the idea that certain knit patterns of Aaron sweaters were rooted in spiritual symbols, biblical symbols. And that goes back to a book written by a guy who was a shopkeeper. Uh, and of course, I'm not remembering his name or the, the title of the book was like the, the, the divine origins of weaving or something like that. And knitting. he was, yeah, of knitting. And he was looking at sweaters around town and he thought that some of the knot work designs reminded him of biblical stuff or spiritual stuff. So he started basically inventing it. He invented this whole lexicon for them uh, and it, he published it in a book. The book, of course, was hit a romantic threat, uh, tone, you know, hit a nerve and so it's sold. And to this day, people are convinced that basically Aaron sweater patterns are related to these ancient, ancient Celtic, Christian, Catholic um, symbols, you know, for good luck or faith in God or <clears throat> salvation or whatever. It's not true. <laughs> I don't know whether the guy believed it sincerely or not, or if he did because he was going to sell the books in his shop. Um, but that is mythic. Um, the history of Aaron Sawyer's is actually a lot shorter than most people think. Um, they were invented purely out of practicality to keep guys from going hypothermic. Period. They were basically indestructible and probably the single most efficient uh, warmth layer ever invented. But their invention doesn't go back more than like the 1880s or so. Believe it or not. And it was also uh, brought to the Aran Islands. Yes. It wasn't invented it there. Was part of a civic, it was thing. part of a, a concerted civic effort because <clears throat> the Aran Islands were undergoing horrible conditions. They needed all they could help, all the help they could get to save the fishing industry. Yeah. So they brought in expert fishermen from other parts of the UK and the Orkneys um, to show these people other fishing techniques and when those guys came over to teach them new fishing techniques uh, and to just to help them do the work, they brought their families with them. And so the wives of those fishermen said, here's how we make sweaters back home. Here, here's how we do this. And then the women in the island said, oh, that's great, but I could do this better. So they turned it into their own thing, but the, but the roots of it actually came from other places. Now, here's the question. Sorry. Would um, the, going back to the book now, or not analogy, but the book example, um, do you think that instead of it, you know, obviously it didn't have religious and, you know, those kind of connotations right out of the box, mm -hmm. um, that wasn't imbued in the origins of it. And it evolved into these things and kind of play with it again through marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but were there regional patterns potentially within it um, in the same way that there's regional dyes or regional tartans within Highland. I think people will try and tell you that. That's another way they market them. I think, oh, this is the pattern from X and X village. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably some truth to that because when you're learning to knit, you're learning from your from, friends from, who are local. Well, from your family. Yeah. So it, the, the grain of truth is the fact that handcrafts are passed down from parent to daughter, parent to son, you know, whatever. Um, and so you have a familial tradition and by extension a community tradition of this is how we've always done it i'm going to show you my favorite stitch and so some of this stuff has become ingrained and and be because of that because of that natural human function and I mean, this is how culture develops this is where culture comes from and that is the grain of truth behind all this stuff we're talking about is that basically you know that you had familial traditions of how to make a thing and you know, for better or for worse, the, the symbology that the guy came up with in his book has lasted and the names of the stitches is useful. So when, you know, they retain it, like, oh, you know, if you want to refer to X stitch, like, oh, well, that's the lily stitch or, oh, that's the, that's a cross stitch, you know? So it is handy for people to communicate about the art. So a practical element of it has been retained for practicality. Yeah. yeah. There, there's, there's always a the way that I always look, try to look at history is through a lens of the KISS model. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. What is the simple, the Occam razor? What's the, the simplest solution? What is the probable cause for how a certain thing evolved? It's probably true. And if there's a big, illustrious, beautiful, well-rounded well, well -rounded story, 
it's probably marketing and somebody taking it and running with it. Mm -hmm. So there's less truth there and you kind of have to dig through it and think about it critically and say, okay, well, did, did the person who developed this stitch really think that this meant that you know this was the the symbol of the cross through Christianity and da da da, da, da. or was it just this is a pretty design that they liked and it, it kind of mm -hmm. came down through a particular family and then which became a region which became a thing in an area so think about things critically and go through it in through that lens um mm -hmm. and then yeah I don't know and, and wrong, the but. the other the other reason these meanings get heaped onto objects is when the object is no longer entirely practical for its purpose. It's been superseded by newer technology. People don't rely on it, rely on it anymore. So there is the risk of it not being made anymore because it doesn't matter anymore on a practical <clears throat> materialist level. Therefore, if you can imbue the object with spiritual, cultural, emotional value, you're incentivizing people to preserve the art form. You see that in Tartan, you see that in in Japanese crafts, you know, I'm a big fan of all the traditional Japanese stuff, you know, like sword making and kosode making and stuff like that, ikat, all that stuff. If you make it, this is our thing and this is our legacy, then you're preserving the art form. So people very quickly will put emotional layers on top of something that's initially just practical because they don't want to see it go away. And people need to find meaning in things. Absolutely. And there's, there's an innate human desire to see deeper into it and imbue a thing with more meaning yep. than it naturally has. Yep. Because it can't just be a pretty pattern. It must mean something. Mm -hmm. And it has to be a, a soul searching thing that's within it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And frankly, it just helps you remember better. That's it very engages true. more parts of your brain. Yeah. So, But All that's right. how it evolves. And that's, that's the fun part of it. Yeah. Okay. Emma, I hope you're nodding over here as an anthropologist. They yes. call it anthropologist. So yeah, okay. this uh, this just in. I got word that uh, the author of that book is Heinz Edgar Q. Thank you. Did Matt give that to you? Wrote the sacred sacred history. Sacred history of knitting. Uh, yes, Matt. Our, Thanks, um, Matt. Fact checker. We just filmed a video about this like a, like a month or so ago, and I've already for, for I always forget I forget names. It is the most frustrating thing in my life as a history nerd is forgetting names. Drives me up a freaking wall. I'm disappointed in you. Yeah. Right, Helen? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not even joking. It really, it drives me up. It drives me up. I get it. Yeah. So um, anyway, thank you, Matt. Yeah. All right. Um, my turn. Um, Adam Langham here uh, wants to know, um, do you, do we recommend different kinds of hose for tall guys with big calves? Um, I know this is a, an issue yes. Matt downstairs runs down to. He's about 6'4 and three trunk legs. Mm-hmm. What what is he settled on as a solution? So he um he does the Piper hose okay. because they have the extra long cuff, but he just cuffs it over once. Um, That's the height issue, not the width issue. Yes, yeah. Right. He um I think there is an, a width an, a width issue there too because when he takes them down, pulls them down, you can see like a fish scale print left on his leg. Yeah. Um. So that's what he does. But yeah. Okay. Um. For. Taller gents, yeah, finding a, ho a pair of hose that will turn down twice, i.e. Piper hose or the cotton hose that we have, mm -hmm. um, are a, a great option. For stretchiness, if you are, you know, whatever height and you have, you know, excessively large legs, then the Lewis hose stretch a little bit more. Um, they're up to, let's say, 19 inches as far as calf circumference. Um, if your legs are exceedingly large, tree trunk-esque, um, then I would say the Harris hose um, from House Cheviot, I uh, think they go up to like 25 or 26 inches for, for diameter of calf. So those are excessively large. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're a great option for those gents. Yeah, basically. Yep. yep, pretty short answer. Yep. Yep. So And don't wash them in hot water. And don't put them in the dryer. Yeah. I'm going to go with Emma for another one. From the audience. That's a good idea. Yes. Okay. That's a short one. Because our next one's going to, we're going to dig into that one too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see here. Us wax poetic and ramble on for hours. Never. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So from um, Sean Mertens, um, he wants to know as a new kilt wearer who is in mm -hmm. high school uh -huh. and wants to wear a kilt to high school, what would you recommend? 
We haven't been <clears throat> age restricted here. Talk sure. to the authorities first. Uh, no, don't talk to the authorities. Really? F forget the authorities. Um, hmm. Okay. Damn the man, save the empire. Um, sorry. Old movie mm. quotes. It, as, as someone whose whose wife is on a, a a school board, I understand. The I I would say this in all honesty: wear underwear. Like, don't even let it be a question. Don't let it be a thing. Just wear freaking underwear. You don't want the other kids in your class. You don't want the authorities. You don't want the school board. You don't want the the the, the teachers. You don't want the principal coming at you for not wearing underwear. Don't let it be a thing. Just freaking wear underwear. Um, start there. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be my first thing. Um, in in the year 2024, with you know uh, things being a little bit more fluid as they are, I would say if you're nervous about it and, you, and you're in a bit more conservative area and, you, and you're concerned you're going to get you know yelled at or kicked out of school, sure ask permission. But I generally find it's a little bit easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. And if you're wearing underwear, you're wearing a kilt, you're you're showing it a little bit more heritage-esque. Um, and you have that, you know, built-in excuse, air quotes, um, then sure, I would just kind of wear it and have fun with it. Maybe give your teacher a heads up. Maybe give your 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 vice principal or principal a heads up. Hey, on Monday, is it cool if I wear my kilt? You know, it's it's Heritage Day. It maybe maybe hook it to St. Patrick's Day. Maybe hook it to a reason or, or uh, like Tartan Day or something like that. At least to like start. That. Yeah, to start. Yeah. Um, maybe hook it to a reason and then say, hey, is it cool if I do this? I really want to do it. It's part of my heritage. Don't worry. I'm going to be wearing underwear because really that's their main concern. It's They don't want it to be a distraction in the classroom and for other, other people yeah. and or have a legal you know, a, a minor wearing something without underwear, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, as long as you're wearing underwear, as long as you have a reason for wearing it, as long as you're wearing it respectfully um, and you're not trying to be disruptive, there generally would be a little bit more forgiving of it. There are absolutely schools who will not want you to do it. And if you ask, if again, if you're in a little bit more of a, a conservative dress area, they might, they might, you know, mm, don't do that. So if you ask permission and they say no, and then you do it, you're going to get in trouble. If you don't ask permission, but you're not doing anything wrong necessarily, you may get, you know, sneak under the wire, get, get away with it, but maybe talk to your parents first and make sure they're cool with you doing it. So that's um, kind of what I was wondering. Yeah. We, we have sidestepped the whole question of whether or not this person has permission from their parental units. Yeah. Um, if your parental units have given you uh, permission to do this, then make sure they know ahead of time that, hey, today's the day I'm going to wear the kilt to school for the first time. If you get a call in the middle you get of a the call, day. <laughs> it's because of this. Um, if you have, you know, somebody who you are friendly with on staff, like a teacher or a coach or, you know, an administrator or something, then, um, that helps. Uh, same, it's kind of the same advice we would give to uh, somebody who wants to wear a kilt to work, essentially. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can you could beg forgiveness instead of asking permission. I have a friend who she was telling about how in high school she had a bet on with her mom about whether she would get hauled into the principal's office for wearing a wallet chain. And her mom was like, don't do it. And she's like, I'm doing it because I'm going to find out if I can get away with it. And the answer was uh, she didn't. But A wallet uh, chain? A wallet chain. What what year was this? Nineties. Jesus. Yep. People. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's a gal I'm going to the this is not Croyton festival with. Oh, nice. My kindred sister. Yeah, she's a she's a big ska head, big rude, big up, big up. rude, rude girl. So yeah, um, rude boy. Yep. So yes, we have data. This no. just in. Da, 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 no, da, I have an opinion. Oh, Emma's oh, point. Have an opinion. Emma has an, an opinion. An opinion. Oh, okay. yes. I, I mean, I was a little bit closer to high school. Um, I'm out. You know, I'm, I'm, just, saying. Oh, I'm just saying. Tread lightly, I, my friend. All right. All right, Sean. I, I was there not too long ago. Please, not too, please, too long ago. Please elaborate. Yes. In the 1800s, it was very different for Eric and I. Emma, <laughs> last year in high school, finds it different. Go ahead. Yes, tell yeah. us. Um. Uh, so my my advice for kilt wearing in high school is that uh, when I was in high school, before you know I gave up, my backpack weighed about 
200 pounds. Like it was a lot. It had, had sat really low on my back and it was, so I would test out if you were wearing your, your kilt to class, like throughout the high school, throughout your, I would test out wearing the backpack, the belt, the sporin, all at the same time. It's a lot to have. Oh, so on. you're going practical. Yeah, I'm going practical, practical. advice. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's I got where your hunch came all from. The time. Okay. It's not that big of a deal. Just tell. I, I would say, yeah, tell your parents you're going to do it, and then if they get a call, they can be like, "It's a kilt. Mm-hmm. I'm not mad at it. <laughs> you, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, but yeah, test out all the stuff that you keep on you in high school. That's a good point. Are there any rules? Were there, were there any rules in your high school of recent times um, that that didn't that you know didn't allow for guys to wear a kilt. Um, you can think of not necessarily. Like, have, like, it it like was a, a looser uniform? dress code. It was huh. like it, there wasn't super strict like things torn. It was just you upset someone, then you got, <laughs> got sent. So yeah. it it's really just depends. I think on on your 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 school and and how well you get along with. With people there, um, make sure it's past the fingertips. Yes, fingertip length was was a rule. Yes, um, no yoga pants was another rule. Mm. Really? So don't do that. No yoga pants and a kilt. <sighs> there goes my Saturday. That's two rules. Well, I know, <laughs> and and some kids get in trouble with um, metal accessories because of uh, metal detectors yeah. now. So you might want to consider if you if your school has metal detectors or a very uh, active security personnel, you might want to do a sporn strap instead of a sporn chain. Little details like that might actually That's a good be point. helpful. Sporn strap. Yeah. yeah. Definitely no yeah. skin do. No. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No. But yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Simpler, mm-hmm. easier. You know, it, it, tone it down a bit. So I, I, I think your yeah. point about the metal sporn chain is a great idea. No skin do. You know, skin do. A hundred percent. Um, I wouldn't even do a kilt pin necessarily. Yeah, don't yeah. don't give them any reason. Yeah, it comes back to this. Don't give them any reason to say no or you can't do it again. So wear underwear, no ski and do, no kilt pin, sporn strap, not a sporn chain. You know, simple wear the rest of your outfit like you normally would for the school. Um, make sure it's, you know, representing heritage properly if you're wearing it for heritage reason so that you can kind of hook it to that wear it for a in a specific event make sure that you know your parents are on board with it and then deal with the fallout what's the worst you're going to get attention it's fine yeah i'd say again it's, at least to start it may be that once these people ac- are acclimated to seeing you in it you can start changing up your outfits and your options and stuff but I feel like we should do this as an after-school special PSA or 1950s film strip. Like, remember, kids, the five rules of wearing a kilt to school. Number one. Number two. I, I'm gonna do that, Adam. We're gonna do that. Yes. With a film film strip sound effect and everything. But but not here right now live. No. Nope. Sorry. Later apparently. Sorry. That's fine. Sorry. Have fun. Report back when you do it. Yeah. Pictures. Tell us. How it happened? Send us, uh, send us uh, photos, video, whatever you got. Um, and if you are another young person who want to wear a kilt to school, tell us what happened. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. There was there was a thing, you know, for for guys wanting to wear a kilt to prom 15 years ago. Yeah, it was a problem caught, back then. It was a problem. You know, schools freaked out about it. Oh my God, he's not going to wear underwear. Oh my, beep, 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 beep. suck it up, Buttercup. Um, but. I'm curious now today because I haven't heard any issues with guys wearing a kilt to prom in the last few years. So I'm curious. Let us know. Let's make that our question of the day. Remember I said we should do the question earlier? Sure. Let's make our question of the day. Go ahead. What do you, as either a young person or a parent perhaps, think of kilts in the classroom and kilts at prom? Should kids in middle school through high school be allowed to wear kilts, and how should they do it? In a non-uniformed school. In a non-uniformed school, yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 If, you have a new, if, if your kid goes to a school with his uniform, your opinion does not matter. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Turn away now. But I'm curious what your opinions are. I think that's a yeah. good question. Yes. We're going to ask. So that's the question of the day. We're asking it now. Start filling in the comments, and then Emma, towards the end, is going to tell us what people think and stuff and things and mm-hmm. whatnot. That's a theory. Yes. Let's we'll see if it works. The more okay. of a chance to do something with that. Was that you or her? Content. That was her. Okay. You. Okay. All right. Here we go. 
Chuck Marks has asked us, uh, he's observed, previously it has been mentioned by us pretty much that Hollywood takes period kilts, makes period kilts too muted, dark, and so that they kind of blend in with the surroundings, very just dark and drab. Generally not as bright as some of the paintings depict. Do you feel that the Glen Affric tartan, which we now have access to, <clears throat> actually supports that viewpoint? Or at least for the average wearer, were more muted colors actually more common than we think? Uh, and uh, Carla McLaughlin was asking uh, about how they figured out what the colors were. So I think we could we can touch sure. on both of those things in the process of answering this. Sure. If only we had an example of the Glen Affric tartan. Oh, wait. Yes, we do. Um, <clears throat> I would say... Yeah, I think Hollywood's gotten it wrong to a degree, but they're playing into a stereotype that people want to believe or that they think is true in that everything in the Dark Ages was dark. Everything pre-1800s was old and, and muddy and dirty and, and, and browns Drab. and grays. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, this is the Glen Affric Tartan. They took a, a, a painstaking process of... Now, this isn't obviously the actual piece. Um, this is the recreation of the, the actual, actual piece. Yes, I'm just throwing it around. It's fine. <laughs> hey, we got it here. It's only 500 years old. Yeah, you know. Hey, there's a spill in the kitchen <clears throat> I want to wipe up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the they, they, they went through a painstaking <coughs> process of an acid bath and, and some other kind of cleaning solution over 14 weeks or something like that yeah. to strip out the peat staining that was in the actual piece of cloth. They carbon dated it. They did all this, a lot of research on a piece of cloth to make sure that they were representing the colors. And they, they went through uh, uh, testing of the dyes that were used to try to figure out the materials that were used in the dyes in the cloth. Yep. Um, Chemical so, testing, microscopic photography, um, yeah, again, a lot of cleaning processes, uh, in, with both acidic and alkaline solutions to remove the peat and the tannins and stuff that were deposited on the fibers from the soil, basically stripping all that away first. So they had a pure sample because the peat, the presence of the peat would have, uh, contaminated the carbon 14 dating also. Yep. So first that, and then all the chemical testing and microscopic photography and all this kind of stuff. So yes, proceed. Yeah. So Sorry. this is <clears throat> this is essentially the a, a reasonably accurate, as best as can be done scientifically, mm -hmm. representation of what the tartan would have looked like. Um, are there examples of of tartans from the 1700s, 1600s that were you know more colorful, or were they all browns and grays and drab and you know this lovely filth down here, Stuart? Um, to quote Monty Python. <laughs> Um, there, there's a, there's a painting by, uh, of, uh, uh, Lord Mungo Murray, where he's yep. wearing a tartan that is yellow and red with a bunch of different stripes in it, that the colors of yellow and red look very, very similar to this. Yeah. It's something that we, you know, put together recently when we got this, this question in. That particular painting is the one it's from, it's between 1668 to 1700. Yeah. Um, now that painting, of course, I think we're looking at unrestored versions of the painting. So it's probably actually brighter colors in real life, but the palette is very similar to what you're seeing here. Now that's about 150, 175 years after this specimen, which is from the, uh, the 1520s to 1600, probably 1520s based on the, the carbon 14 dating, but the 16th century, AKA 1500s for sure. So now the question that I have is um, fashion trends. Could there have been a fashion trend somewhere during the 1500s to, to 1800s or early, you know, late 1700s um, where there was browns and grays and more drab colors? Sure. Um, fashion nowadays is, you know, almost seasonal or what's the color of the year or what's the, you know, what's the, what's the in thing right now? And it's a lot more cyclical with fast fashion. Um, now back then, you know, 1500s, 1600s, there would have been trends within it as well, whether it's colors, whether it's patterns, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, but 
I don't think it would have necessarily been of the year. It may have been of the decade and it would have moved mm -hmm. slower. Mm -hmm. The question is, how slow would it have moved? Would it like, would these be popular colors for a hundred years or for 50 years or for five years? How fast would fashion have moved? Mm -hmm. Answer that. You're asking me? Go ahead. I'm, I'm, uh, I have no idea. Seven and a half years. Exactly. Good number. Per color. Perfect. That's the answer. Eric has it. Done. Um, I think there's potential for that, as we have talked about earlier. The uh, But the other factor is economics. Um, it is Hollywood getting it wrong still? Yes. I'm sorry. I really still think that they tend to make things darker and more drab than they actually were. Now, was everyone dressed in bright colors? No. Um, we have a, a strong suspicion, based on what evidence there is, that the brighter color tartans were mostly the province of people of means. Uh, the poorer you were, the more likely it was that you needed your clothing fast, and you needed it practical, and you didn't have access to all of the uh, herbs and dyes and minerals you know, that, that came from other parts of the country or other parts of the world to make those really cool colors you have a couple here because we got some woad that grows around here and we got some we got some we got lots of uh, uh nettles that grow over here about down down in the valley so we can make these colors or matter or whatever yeah thing. yeah but some of these other colors are harder to get and we don't have and you know what it's easier if i just use some wool from this sheep who's kind of you know tannish colored white colored and then we have some that this we have you know harvey over here who's a charcoal color and if i use those then I can get some colors that way. So the poorer you are, the less color you may have had. We know that richer people had more color, but it was not as drab as people think. Um, and and even with the color, there's a variety of sources that came into it. We know that um, from the analysis that um, one of the colors in this, at least, you know, the the brown, uh, is from the undyed natural wool of a sheep. That color came from just the wool itself. Um, the, uh, the greens and blues, um, are probably woad or indigo, uh, most likely woad in my opinion. Um, the other colors are not as sure on, but they are definitely dye materials that were available in the area. It's more a question of the time and the effort that goes into using the dyes to make the cloth. It's the, it's the extra effort of having to go through all those steps. Okay. So, you know. That, that's what we're talking about is economics. The other thing that people don't always keep in mind nowadays is the fact that you very often inherited clothing. A good garment would be passed down to your son or daughter. Very often, if it was a stitched garment, you would be deconstructing it and reconstructing it into something that was more fashionable. But the cloth itself was passed down often through several generations. So things absolutely moved more slowly. <clears throat> um, I think it's more about social station and economic station and where we do have pictorial evidence not the not the 1500s like this but for the 1600s and especially the 1700s they're bright colors i mean if you watch outlander and think that everybody's running around in those really drab bleh, tartans that they show that's not correct i mean look at the freaking portraiture from the age and they're just blazing with color look at the culloden uh extant culloden jacket mm -hmm. you know it's it's nice rich colors so I still think Hollywood gets it wrong. They're getting better, but I still think they get it wrong. I I will uh, end of sermon. No, no, I, I no, not not the end yet. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, brother. I'm just getting warmed up. Testify. <clears throat> Amen, brother. Hallelujah. Um, the I'm I'm going to go at the color and expense angle from the other end. It's don't think of it as the 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 trap that I've fallen in is, and it, it kind of had a light bulb moment just there. Is it's not that, hey, I'd like to weave a tartan. Therefore, I want this red and this blue and this purple and this green. So I don't care what it costs, weave it versus I want a tartan, but I can't afford those colors. So weave these ones. Don't think of it that way. It's the mill, the person weaving the actual cloth is saying, okay, I'm gonna use this red, this blue, this green, and I'm gonna do this design. And now 
I'm going to make one that's going to be more time efficient, more cost efficient, and I'm just going to use the natural green, or excuse me, the natural brown and the natural black and the natural uh, cream kind of color ecru that I have available, and I'm going to make up a pattern within that. So here's the two that I'm going to offer. One didn't need dyeing, and I could do it a lot faster, and it was all local stuff versus something that was you know, let's say local dyes, and then one that's more uh, elusive, or, you know, this is from India, this is from, you know, this are, you know, a trade route kind of dyes. So I'm going to offer three different options. One far-flung dyes, one local dyes, one non-dyed. Mm -hmm. And those are going to be yeah. their three price points of this one's the most expensive, this one's a midland, you know, a medium expensive, and this one's a less expensive for people who can't afford to have it dyed, but they still need cloth, they still need clothing. So that's kind of how I just, you know, light bulb thought about it is, okay, well, great. Now as a, as a proprietor, as a mill, as someone who's selling this stuff, I can offer different options. I'm dropping the cloth. Sorry. Oh, no. buddy. Um, I can offer different options within it. And, but that's more, again, the kiss rule, the mm -hmm. Occam's razor, how it probably came about versus people custom yeah. you know, requiring things who didn't have a budget. They would just buy what's available. And yep. the cheapest thing available is non-dyed local sheep. Mm -hmm. um, now that, I think I think you're right there, although that does post-date this particular specimen with Glen Affric because Glen Affric was definitely homemade. Yes. It was drop spun wool. It was definitely, you know, produced in a home, a household setting, let's say, not an industrial setting. Well, it so. was also a very, very fine example of drop spindle. Yep. It is also a very fine example of, you know, of different things. We know the wool came from several different sheep, which also, which implies that they were picking out the best wool yes. for this. This was a garment that was made for somebody who had the means and who was important enough to warrant it. The boss. Yes. Basically. So, yeah. Yeah. Another reason why you should buy it, because you want to look like a boss. Glenn Afric from USAKilts.com. Available now. Um... <laughs> All right. I love nerding <clears throat> out of this stuff. I'm sure a lot of people are just like, okay. Indeed. Shut up. All right. One more shut question, up. Emma. That sure. was Eric. We've, we've been we've been waxing poetic yeah. for too long. Give us yeah. one more, and then we'll do the question of the day, which we've already done, but we'll ask for <laughs> answers of the question of the day. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. So uh, we've got a, a question from Alex Chittenden. Uh, most of my kilts are on the earthier dark are on the earthier darker colors. What would you recommend to someone wanting to expand into brighter, more colorful tar ends? Hmm. If you're, if you're, you tend to do weathered, darker, or like modern, but like black watch, like minimal amounts of color in it. But you want to do something a little bit more uh, fun, a little bit more bold, a little bit more outgoing. Maybe look at either a red tartan within the weathered color palette. Or look for something in the muted color palette. It kind of yes. it kind of splits the difference yes. between modern jewel tone, you know, darker colors versus something that's bold and bright and out there. So there's there's a lot of uh, muted colors that will go very very well. Um, or alternatively, suck it up and jump in with both feet. The water's fine. Um, find a tartan that you're maybe a little bit uncomfortable with, or it's a little bit outside your normal comfort zone um, and do something different and fun. Just, just to just resign yourself to the fact that, Hey, you know what? I'm going to do one. I'm going to start with one and see what happens. Um, and not to get, you know, like USA kill specific, but let's say like Nordic heritage, mm -hmm. it's a, a beautiful, so says the guy, you know, the people who designed it, <laughs> a beautiful tartan um, with a, a beautiful medium, but you know, reasonably bright light blue and a marled gray. And there's a lot of like, you know, kind of neutral tones within it. So maybe do something like that, that has a singular color that kind of stands out, but a lot of neutral colors as well. And start dipping your toe in the colored waters, so to speak, um, there. Yeah. That, those would be my kind of general thoughts. Yeah, that's a, exactly what I was going to say. The only uh, the only tactic I would suggest would be, what's your favorite color? Look at the other clothing in your closet. What do you have the most of? And then find a tartan that's like, you know, oh yeah, I've always really liked aqua. 
So I'm going to get an aqua tartan. You know, let's go yeah. with that way. Good point. Find mm -hmm. something that you already have access to and that you're most comfortable with. Yeah. Because if you're going to do a bold kind of statement piece color, mm -hmm. then pick your favorite one so you're most comfortable wearing it. Yeah. Good Trust thought. your gut. Yeah. Trust your gut. It'll be fine. Absolutely. So question of the day was, what was the question of the day? You had it. So I uh, what do you think about kids wearing kilts to prom or even on the daily in school? Yes. So let us know down in the comments what you think about kids wearing kilts to school, cultural expression or otherwise, just for fun and, you know, uh, gets and shiggles, so to speak. Emma, have there been any responses from the peanut gallery yeah. on the question? Yeah, there have been quite a few people. I'll just blow, throw, blow through some here. Um, Adam Lewis says, classroom, no, prom, yes. And hmm. um, he points out that he is Scottish. Cool. Um, Harold Connell says, go for it. Um, Zelia says, um, check the length uh, rules for girl skirts at your school to see if it falls under that. Um, and then um, some people talking, uh, Elliot wore a kilt to his homecoming, homecoming dance in the early 90s um, in a very conservative area, but their mascot was a Scot, so it went over pretty well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, kind of had an in right there. Uh, kilt in class, David Kirk, kilt in classroom, no. Kilt at prom, certainly. Um, Kirk Kinneman says 100% yes for kids in school and at school functions. Um, but also brings up that um, a bullying can be an issue, too. So make sure you've got some support. Yep. Make sure you're um, ready. Uh, Kilch, Eric Maxwell says kilt should be allowed in the classroom as long as the wearer treats it with respect. Um, uh, Michaela is saying that her son wore a kilt to his prom in 2004. Um, so and, and Jason points out that if if ladies, if girls at school can wear skirts and dresses, um, they really shouldn't have an issue with uh uh, a guy wearing a kilt. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I find it interesting. The uh, A, I agree on the goose and gander scenario there. Um, I, I find it interesting that people are already making the differentiation between a formal event and a daily event. I so that very prom versus in school kind of daily mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I love the point, which we didn't make. So thank you for making that about um, making sure that, you know, well, hey, bullying will probably be a thing. So make sure you have a support system. Um, yeah. And also, but at the same time, I don't see anyone wearing a kilt to school that would be you know, so influenced by peer pressure. You, you kind of, you got to have, you know, a, a bit of heart, a bit of guts, a bit of moxie to wear a kilt yep. um, and, and a bit of self uh, uh Self-determination, self-confidence. Yeah, exactly. Um, to be able to pull it off. If you're if you're not confident, if you're concerned what other people think about you, you probably wouldn't even consider wearing a kilt to school in the first place. So I bullying, yes, will probably be a thing, but if you've got the if you've got the guts to do it in the first place, you know, mm -hmm. you you've probably got this. I think and, and or or if you're trying to build the confidence, because I think a lot of time younger folks, you you, you youths out there. <clears throat> Um, things like this are an, an exercise in testing, testing your metal, you know, proving something to yourself, you know, giving yourself a challenge to rise to. I mean, you know, we can, you know, we've both had experiences like that directly. So I think there's something to be that too. I mean, if you want to challenge yourself with this, um, then yeah, absolutely go for it. You know, you're just by asking the question and making up your mind that you're going to try, you win. So and you, you've already proven something to yourself. You've already decided. And, and yeah, the, the, the reaction again, if I could travel back in time and talk to 16, 18 year old Rocky who was single at the time, absolutely freaking lutely wear a kilt, dude, the women go crazy for it. So <laughs> will you There's catch that. hell from, you know, the, the captain of the football team who's going to be like, Oh, you're gay. Where's girl? Yes. But. The head cheerleader will probably give you her phone number, so it'll be fine. Um, or so, but that's kind of the point: is that you get to test the boundaries and play with it, and it will a test your metal, b build your confidence in speaking to others about it. And you know, if you're a straight guy looking for girls, it's a great way to show you're confident. And again, 
test your metal with the bullies. And if you're confident, it's you're you're gonna be able to, you know, to to take the slings and arrows that come at you from it. And it's going to just make you a stronger person. So yeah, do it. The one last point, but then we should wrap it up. Advice we always give to new kilt wearers in general applies here also. Wear it at home to practice so you're completely comfortable in it and know how you want to sweep the pleats when you sit down and all how it's going to behave, how it's going to feel. So when you go into school, you're totally ready. If, <clears throat> if you already wear kilts, then this is a moot point. But, you know, basic advice, just you know, yeah. wear it at home a few times to make sure you understand how it feels. And the other thing we give to kilt wear, first time kilt wearers is wear it at a time where it's a little bit more appropriate or where there's going to be other people. Right. So now there won't probably won't be other people in your school wearing a kilt, but if you wear it for Tartan Day or for St. Patrick's Day or for an appropriate or for burn supper or like like the end of January. Spirit Day, maybe. Or Spirit Day Possibly. if you have something to match your, your school's colors. Exactly. If you're wearing it in a time where it's more appropriate, you're likely to catch less hell than you would if you're wearing it on a random Tuesday in November. So, right. yes, if you can time it a little bit, sure, that can help. But if you're confident, you got this. And wear sunscreen. Exactly. So everyone else, keep telling us down in the comments. Yeah, what keep it coming. Keep it coming. You think. Keep it rolling. Keep it going. Keep this train going. All right, cool. Until next time, boys and girls. Slanjava. 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 Gum. What's his face from Lanza? Yep. It's just I was like, gonna say Lars for it, not Lars. But he was like her yeah. mentor, but it's just like Yeah. When she said hey. Yeah. What? <laughs> Can I ask?